Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're sitting. And welcome to this uh, 10th anniversary celebration of the bilateral air safety agreement between the United States and the FAA of the United States, of course, and the European Union and the European Commission, represented by DG Move. Today is a, a seminar where we shall look into the issues around, or the upcoming issues, more importantly, perhaps, uh, the issues around the bilateral air, air safety agreement, and also to talk about some of the things that we're going to need to focus on in the future, including, of course, most importantly, both safety forever and sustainability forever going forward, if you like. My name is Andrew Charlton. I have the honour of hosting today's event but you will, you will be sick of the sight of me by the end of it because I'm going to come on and off. But more importantly, you are going to hear from some of the most important people in the transatlantic aviation community and the transatlantic safety uh, community. And it's those people that we need to hear from first and most importantly, of course. And with that in mind, I would like to first ask Mr Ali Bahrami, the Federal Aviation Administration's Assistant Administrator for Safety, if he would be so kind as to welcome us and to give his opening remarks. Ali, if you'd be so kind. Thank you, Andrew, for setting the stage for today's uh, conversation. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the US-EU Safety and Sustainability Summit and to talk to you about the FAA's ongoing work with our European counterparts at the European Commission and the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. While we are meeting virtually, we are confident that we will be able to resume in-person meetings in the near future, and we look forward to hosting the 2022 FAA EASA Safety Conference in Washington, D.C. next June. The scope of today's event is both safety and sustainability. While my remarks will focus on safety cooperation, you will hear from FAA Administrator Steve Dixon and others on their perspective related to sustainability over the next few hours. We will also provide you with insights into ongoing safety regulatory work between the FAA, the Commission, and EASA. First and foremost, it is important to know that our cooperative work has never paused and our relationship is strong. I want to start off by highlighting the resurgence of air travel and transatlantic air service that we have seen in recent weeks. We all welcome the recovery of air travel as we enter the summer season. In addition to our ongoing collaboration on the implementation of the US-EU safety agreement, we have been working diligently with our international partners to tackle the new aviation safety challenges we have faced as a result of the pandemic. This has required all of us to find innovative approaches to continue our work in all areas of aviation safety and prepare for the recovery of air travel. Our global cooperation has been critical to our success over the past year. Our relationship with the Commission and EASA is founded on our shared commitment to highest levels of global aviation safety and to focus our attention on areas that represent the highest safety risk. Over the past year, the FAA, the AEC, and EASA have continued to work closely on a full range of significant technical issues. For example, we have worked together in the ICAO Council Aviation Recovery Task Force Initiative, the return of the Boeing 737 MAX to service, and the expansion of the reciprocal acceptance under US-EU safety agreement. The US and EU safety agreement is the time-tested framework for aviation safety cooperation and has become a model for such cooperation throughout the world. The safety agreement was signed in 2008 and it entered into force in 2011. 2021 
marks the 10th year of cooperation under the agreement, a milestone we are proud to highlight today. It is important to note that our cooperation with our European partners on aviation safety predates the safety agreement and can be tracked back well into the last century. It is a strong relationship that has evolved and developed over time. We expect it to be the foundation for aviation safety cooperation for decades to come. Aviation safety cooperation under the safety agreement yields significant benefits to the FAA and EASA, as well as the US and European industry through the reduction of duplicative work. We appreciate being able to rely on our trusted partner, EASA, to do work on behalf of the FAA and vice versa. It facilitates the import and export of civil aviation products and services between US and the EU through reciprocal acceptance of safety findings. The safety agreement when it was signed in 2011 included annexes and implementation procedures for airworthiness and environmental certification and repair station approvals. I am proud to have witnessed firsthand how confidence in each other's system has continued to grow. As a result, the scope of this agreement has expanded over time. Together with Philippe Cornelius of the Commission, I have co-chaired the agreement's bilateral oversight board, or BOB, which is the executive governing body responsible for ensuring effective functioning of the safety agreement. As today is my last day at the FAA before retiring, I would like to personally thank Philippe and Patrick for their cooperation and partnership throughout my tenure. It's been a pleasure working with you. I'm pleased to say that we accomplished a lot over the past four years. We made significant progress, including an expansion of the scope of the safety agreement in 2020 to include two new annexes that cover recurrent approvals for flight simulators, training devices, and conversion of pilot licenses. The Bob has also signed a number of decisions that amended the annexes and have had tangible benefits for the aviation community, including reduced validation level of involvement and associated fee reductions. The technical oversight boards for each of the four annexes also meet regularly to advance cooperative work on aircraft certification, maintenance, pilot licensing, and flight simulators. Of course, there's also daily interaction at the staff level on a broad range of technical projects. We're continually looking to ensure strategic use of the safety agreement framework to continue to improve efficiency and strengthen our safety cooperation. This has great benefits to us as regulators and provides support for our industry. We know that we will be challenged, we will see challenges ahead but it is our shared commitment and long-standing relationship that allows us to take on those new challenges and to foster innovation. Regardless of the challenges we face in the years to come as aviation system grows more complex and integrated, we know that we share the same goal to improve aviation safety around the globe. Thank you, enjoy today's event Andrew, back to you, sir. Ali, thank you very much, and thank you for your remarks. It's a good thing that we got this conference on today because I'm sure everybody joins with me in wishing you all the very best uh, in your retirement. Uh, you mentioned a lot of things that I thought were really interesting, the most important of which perhaps being that the structure that the EU and the US have built 
in this framework has become uh, time tested and is now sort of the trusted framework around the world. You also mentioned Philippe Cornelis, and it's my pleasure now to introduce Philippe, who is the Director of Aviation at DG Move for the European Commission. Philippe, if you'd like to reply, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a, a great pleasure uh, for me as well to uh, open this webinar together with Ali Barami, uh, with whom indeed I have worked so closely uh, for many years on uh, aviation safety. It was our pleasure and our honor to have been the guardians of that um, a, a momentous agreement between the EU and the US, the agreement on cooperation in civil aviation safety that has been in place now for around uh, 10 years. It has been a disagreement, a milestone in our uh, aviation relations, both for our aviation safety cooperation at government level, but also for the aviation community and the industry. It has provided tangible benefits and cost saving through the reciprocal acceptance of certificates in particular. And it is really uh, the framework for our cooperation now and in the future to enhance aviation safety uh, to the highest level. It is also a testimony to the trust and the close cooperation between two world leading aviation safety authorities in Europe uh, and the US, EASA and uh, the FAA. I'm indeed also proud to mention that uh, joint achievement uh, with Ali Barami, uh, that we were able to expand the scope of the agreement uh, recently uh, in relation to pilot licensing. Indeed, we do expect that in Europe, uh, several thousand pilots uh, will take advantage uh, of the new provisions to easily convert uh, their licenses and ratings. Uh, and on flight uh, simulation training devices, uh, we enabled reciprocal acceptance of findings that will eliminate duplicate evaluations um, while maintaining highest safety levels uh, and savings will be passed on to the air carriers that are sending uh, pilots for training. I'm sure our experts and industry representatives in panel A will follow up on our current and future collaboration to further strengthen our transatlantic aviation safety cooperation. And sustainability is going to be the second theme for uh, today's webinar. Uh, decarbonization is a huge uh, challenge for aviation, but it needs to contribute as a sector if we want to achieve net zero emissions by the middle of this century. One important measure will be to reduce the carbon intensity of air transport fuels, but uh, that will not be sufficient and we will need to look also at all options to achieve a truly sustainable aviation. This is a shared top policy priority for both the EU and the US sides. And I'm therefore also very much uh, looking forward to uh, the exchange in, in panel B uh, with leading experts and aviation representatives from both sides of the Atlantic on how to tackle climate change in aviation. Before we continue with today's program, I also want to take the opportunity to personally thank Ali Bahrami for his cooperation, for our partnership, our friendship. Ali has been a keen advocate of the transatlantic safety cooperation since he became the associate administrator in the FAA in 2017. And since he took office, our aviation safety cooperation has indeed much developed uh, and he has been key to the successful expansion uh, of the scope uh, of the agreement. And I remember very well, Ali, your focus that I fully shared on delivering tangible results uh, for our sector uh, in our uh, joint work. And I think we have achieved that. Now, I hope uh, that you will uh, enjoy today's event and the debates in the two panels. Thank you to all for joining us today. And with that, I hand back to our moderator, Andrew Charlton. Thanks very much, Philippe, and thank you for those very kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker on our agenda is um, Mr. Henrik Holloway, who is the Director General of DG Move at the European Commission. DG Move, of course, the Directorate General for Transport and for Transport and Mobility. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to uh, ask Henrik if he'd be so kind as to address us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm very humbled and privileged to speak at this uh, very important event, which is uh, jointly organized by uh, EU and uh, US authorities. I'm also excited to be part of this unwavering expression of transatlantic unity, and I'm most pleased to welcome participants from all over the world who are joining us today at this webinar. Welcome. Many of you who know me also know that I have always been and always will be a firm proponent of a close transatlantic relationship. I'm equally convinced that the EU and the US have to continue to be the role models for the rest of the world and drive forward the global agenda, not only in aviation, but also in many other areas. I'm very pleased that President Biden visited Brussels a few weeks ago and met with the European leaders, bringing the strong message of re-established partnership with EU and NATO. I think it also gives the good spirit to our event today. In aviation, over decades, we have been showing the world the way forward, be it about safety, security, or regulatory developments. The best proof of that is our transatlantic aviation partnership, a fundamental pillar of our relationship that has allowed us to develop an exceptionally close cooperation in many areas of air transport. This in turn has allowed us for more than over a decade to travel more safely, more affordably, and more frequently, as well as to get to know even better each other on both sides of the Atlantic. Today, it would, it would be an excellent opportunity to discuss with our friends and partners from the FAA and the US Department of Transport, as well as with the representatives of our aviation community, how to further enhance our cooperation, in particular in the domain of aviation safety, and how to better face the challenge of making aviation more sustainable. On aviation safety, the EU-US cooperation has been built on trust and confidence that has allowed us to fully benefit from our BASA agreement that has served us well and also during the challenging times. As it has already been said earlier, to give you an example, despite the pandemic, last year we agreed to extend the scope of BASA to two new important areas, oversight of flight simulators and recognition of pilot licenses. No doubt that the new larger scope of BASA brings direct and tangible benefits for the aviation industry through enhanced recognition of certificates, resulting in turn lower costs for aviation stakeholders. Another good example is our bilateral cooperation during the technical investigation concerning Boeing 737 MAX, <clears throat> which was performed in close cooperation with the FAA. It was not an easy process and not always a straightforward process, but in the end, it can definitely be seen as a good success story for both sides. Good partners and friends do not need to agree on every step of every process, but our partnership allowed us to build a working atmosphere where the differences were talked through, disputed, and in the end, the best solutions were found that guarantee at the same time the highest level of safety, together and in constructive working environment. For me, this is what a true partnership is really about. I'm, I'm therefore very pleased to say that despite the many challenges, including the COVID pandemic, our cooperation has definitely further matured, deepened and intensified over the last years. <laughs> The EU-US air transport agreement has been a success story for the past 15 years. I'm confident that we would be able to deepen and widen this agreement in the future. If there is a will, there is a way, and we need to make sure we do have the will to do so. Many who know me are well aware that I have raised this issue many times over the last five years, and I hope we will embark on getting even more benefit out from this precious agreement. I'm equally confident that the transatlantic market 
will continue to be a backbone of our respective industries and significant contributor to our economies. The air transport agreement is also important for the recovery of our aviation post-pandemic. And I would like to underline that one of our key priorities should be the restart of the transatlantic aviation corridor. Our two continents have been kept apart during the pandemic by sometimes justified, sometimes unjustified actions by our political masters. Now, when the vaccination process is well on the way on the both shores of the Atlantic, there should be no excuse not to open up for people who want to travel, see their relatives, friends, or just new and old places. We are well aware that the health safety protocols that have been established in aviation go very far in risk mitigation. Risk elimination is simply not possible, but we have gone as far as we could. Traveling by air is safe, and it is time for the relevant authorities to acknowledge that. Last year saw the EU-US seat capacity crashing down from a record 70 million to less than 10 million <coughs> passengers. And despite the current positive developments in fighting the pandemic on both sides of the Atlantic, travel restrictions remain an obstacle to recovery. Shutting down the largest international market has created a void for too long now. On June 18, the EU decided to add the US to the list of countries that will be allowed to travel to the EU without an essential purpose. Some member states were advising to delay this move until the US has agreed to reciprocate. I'm happy that we nevertheless opened up, but we all know that the transatlantic traffic will only be fully restored when the relevant US presidential proclamations banning Europeans from visiting the US will be lifted. I can only hope this will happen soon. As Europe has taken the first steps to restore the transatlantic travel, I hope that the EU-US high-level travel working group will soon yield further normalization. Current situation is not normal nor acceptable. I also have frequent contacts with the US carriers, and they are all very keen to return to the transatlantic market. It is time to accelerate the work and make opening up transatlantic travel a genuine priority. As a very important step, the EU has set up also the digital COVID certificate. It covers COVID vaccination, test and recovery certificates, and will significantly facilitate the restoration of free movement and travel within the EU. The system will be fully operational from tomorrow, and we are willing to work with interested partners around the world that wish to connect their COVID certificates to it through an adequacy decision with, would be based on a mutual recognition of respective certificates. Let us focus on the good spirit of the air transport agreement when building back the transatlantic market. By further deepening our partnership, we can lead by example and drive our shared vision of open, competitive and rule-based international aviation. Let us not spoil this by raising again the controversial topic of flags of convenience that can only damage our relationship and would not help us to recover and build back better. I know you can agree with me on that, and I thank you for your support in advance. Allow me now to say a few words about our cooperation in air traffic management. We have many commonalities in the area of ATM, in particular in terms of resilience of the infrastructure and the need for smart investments in innovation. For Europe, we estimate that inefficiencies in the European ATM network result in an average additional fuel burn of 8.6 uh, to 11.2 percent. Consequently, ATM modernization can and must contribute to the environmental objectives of future aviation at global scale. This requires strong common effort to promote innovation, namely through digitalization and global interoperability. I'm pleased that we have integrated these priorities into our renewed cooperation on ATM modernization and that the Executive Committee, which has been established for this topic under our Memorandum of Cooperation, has guided the teams to address the environmental benefits in the future cooperative work plans. Two years ago, in 2019, speaking in the International Aviation Club in Washington, D.C., one of my most favorite locations to speak, I said the following, and I quote, as aviation emissions grow, it brings me to the main and arguably greatest current challenge, managing the environmental footprint of aviation. In order to maintain the license to grow, one pessimist even referred to the license to exist, 
emissions have to come down. In Europe, we observe that people's mindset about that is changing very fast and without the slightest doubt, public demand and societal expectations for cleaner and much more sustainable air transport will grow rapidly in the coming years. Today, two years later, I have to say that the same words are as valid as, or perhaps even more valid than back then. This is also the reason why today's event focuses in addition to safety issues also on the issues related to aviation sustainability. The European Green Deal covers all sectors of the economy, including transport and aviation. In order to reach the overarching objective of making the EU carbon neutral by 2050, the transport sector as a whole needs to reduce its emissions by 90%. This means that we have to accelerate the sectoral efforts to reduce aviation emissions for the EU to meet its climate objectives. At the same time, we are well aware that aviation is one of the most challenging sectors for the drastic reduction of emissions. And there is not one solution, but we need to build on a multiple solutions. These include market-based measures like ETS, Corsia, innovation, new technologies, meaning also new type of aircraft, and one of the main immediate tools to reach this goal, which is the uptake of sustainable aviation fuels, which has the potential to save up to 85% of emissions. There is a clear advantage of supporting SAFs. We can continue relying on the same planes, engines, and infrastructure, and still reduce our carbon footprint by blending kerosene with sustainable aviation fuels. The Commission will table the proposal of refuel EU aviation in two weeks as part of the FIT 55 package in order to create the conditions for the accelerated uptake of the SAFs in Europe. The introduction of SAF will, however, not be sufficient for meeting the climate objectives of the EU, and our work cannot stop here. The development of hydrogen and electricity-powered planes, as well as construction of zero-emission airports and fair pricing of carbon, will provide additional push for greening the sector. I think that on both sides of the Atlantic, we are convinced that the transition to SAFs will be an essential step for the decarbonization of the sector. The challenge is huge, especially in the beginning of this transition, and it will require bold policy measures and strong industry commitment. I also feel and see SAF as an area where we should work closely together, EU and US, and share experiences, as there are different ways to promote this transition. I suggest we take this topic as part of the conclusions of today's event as a priority topic to be embedded in our overall aviation cooperation framework. We have many shared objectives, and if we continue to drive the global agenda, we should push them together on the global scene. ICAO will hold its triennial assembly next year. This will be an opportunity for us to jointly contribute to the adoption of the ambitious objectives in this area of sustainability, and in particular with the definition of a long-term goal, but equally in safety, security, ATM, and economic matters. Let us continue to lead global aviation towards the high standards while maintaining open and competitive markets to support the aviation industry. Let's do that together. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, before I finish, allow me first to pay a personal tribute to Steve and his team. Over the last years, we have maintained a close and constructive relationship at all times. It's very much thanks to your leadership, Steve, and the engagement of your team. And I'm very grateful and most appreciative personally to you for that. Very lastly, it is also my understanding that Ali is soon leaving for retirement and new challenges will be ahead of him. I wanted to sincerely and wholeheartedly thank him on behalf of our team. You have been a valued and treasured partner and we very much appreciate all the good cooperation with you. Good luck for the future. And dear friends, thank you all for your kind attention. I wish you an interesting, thought-provoking and enjoyable event today. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Henrik. And uh, I found that really fascinating. As you rightly point out, the, the challenges are clearly not just safety, but also sustainability. And with that in mind, it's my complete pleasure to introduce Mr. Steve Dixon, who is the Federal Aviation Administration's Administrator. Uh, Steve, I once got into trouble for calling one of your predecessors by their name, but I'm pretty sure your name is Steve, so I'm going to call you Steve. Uh, Steve, 
do you feel that Henrik's on the point? Is it safety and sustainability that we need to focus on first and foremost? Andrew, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yes, I think uh, my friend uh, Henrik is, is right on point. Um, and I, I, but I want to start by saying uh, that it is, uh, I'm also very humbled uh, and honored to uh, be in the company of some of uh, the most important and respected uh, leaders in, uh, in global aviation today. And, and welcome, everyone. I want to thank the European Commission. Uh, my good uh, friend and colleague, uh, Henrik, and everyone at DG Move for co-hosting today's event with the FAA. And I think that Henrik's comments were right on point on, in so many respects. Uh, the transatlantic partnership and our level of collaboration has never been stronger. And when uh, Henrik and I were talking about uh, setting up this event back earlier this spring, uh, we really wanted to reinforce that point. And, and the importance of, of U.S. and EU collaboration and, and leadership. Uh, you know, and usually this is the part in, in uh, uh, a typical uh, speech where uh, the, the presenter might say, you know, this is a very important time uh, in aviation. But I would just say in response that, you know, has there ever been a time in aviation that was not important? Uh, we're always seeing some level of growth, recovery. Uh, we're dealing with disruptive global events from time to time. And of course, now as we see the unrelenting uh, pace and the adoption of new uh, technologies. And so for these reasons, uh, in many ways, this period is no different nor uh, more or less important. But I would say that what we have done together over the last couple of years and what we will do going forward is extremely consequential. Uh, it is absolutely more, more uh, consequential, I think, than ever. You know, our industry connects the world. It collect, connects cultures. Uh, it makes the world smaller. And aviation, uh, as Henrik said, can accelerate economic recovery. And more importantly, this industry can be a tremendous catalyst for change, for new solutions and technologies that make our world better. And in this moment, it's up to all of us to ensure the safe resurgence of an aviation industry that's been battered by COVID-19 and in the longer term, make flying safer while also protecting our environment. So that's why we're gathering for this webinar today to discuss these two very important topics and talk about all the great work uh, that, has, that has already happened, but also uh, how we need to collaborate uh, even more closely going forward. So let's take a look. You know, we're beginning to see an increase in passenger travel after more than a year. We're also seeing rapid innovation with drones, uh, rockets, uh, commercial space, and other uh, new exciting uh, vehicles. And we're also facing heightened challenges, uh, cyber threats, and of course, climate change. The FAA is absolutely committed to making aviation safer more efficient and greener around the world. Uh, we do this as both an operator, as the air navigation service provider uh, for the US and our, uh, our oceanic areas, and also as a regulator. And we can only meet that goal through strong alliances with other nations. None more significant uh, than our partnership with the EU. President Biden made this clear on his trip to Europe earlier this month for the US-EU Transatlantic Summit. He reaffirmed the primacy of the US-European alliance. The bonds and partnerships that we have forged through NATO and in other countless uh, other areas uh, continue to serve the interests of both sides uh, extremely effectively. The FAA strongly values our safety partnership with the European Commission. And to that end, our aviation safety line of business works very closely and in close collaboration with its colleagues at the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. The US-EU Aviation Safety Agreement is the bedrock of that partnership. Now, as part of this agreement, EASA validates our approvals of aviation products and parts, and we validate EASA certifications. The reciprocal acceptance of safety findings 
has steadily reduced the duplication of work by both organizations. It enables all of us to concentrate on new technology and higher risk safety issues that we all want to drive down. Together with the EU, we're working with stakeholders, manufacturers, and operators to enhance aviation safety around the world. We've proven that we can accomplish more with better results when we work together. One example is our close work on the safety evaluations for the grounded Boeing 737 MAX aircraft. The US-EU cooperation improved the transparency and sharing of knowledge and showed us new ways that we can work together in the future, both on certifications and validations. And because of this hard work, we are now, I am absolutely convinced, stronger than ever. You know, I've said many times that safety is a journey, not a destination. Aviation safety must always be approached with humility and with collaboration in mind. It's important that we always keep this uh, at the forefront of our thoughts. And most journeys are, of course, better when you have trusted uh, travel mates taking that journey with you. You know, if the last couple of years have, have shown us anything, it's that the public expects the same level of safety no matter, no matter where they travel. And as a worldwide aviation community, it's incumbent upon all of us to work together to deliver on that expectation and that promise. This requires us to constantly look for ways to make flying safer, whether it's through a better understanding of human factors or finding more effective ways to train flight crews of varying experience levels to operate increasingly complex aircraft in an increasingly complex aviation system. We must also broaden the use of safety management systems to include aviation manufacturers and strengthen oversight and international engagement. The success of our work together has reaffirmed why these kinds of safety improvements are necessary and why we must continue to pursue improvements in all areas. Now, of course, in the middle of our work uh, over the past year, of course, we were confronted with the challenges of COVID-19. Here again, the United States and Europe stepped up. We worked multilaterally through all three phases of the ICAO Council's Aviation Recovery Task Force. And through this forum, we provided consistent guidance for air carriers and airports to protect airline passengers and workers from virus exposure and transmission. We also provided guidance on virus testing, quarantining, and transporting of vaccines. In the US, we acted quickly to issue regulatory relief for industry and exemptions for airmen on medical certificates and recurrent training while ensuring that all safety needs were addressed. After vaccines were approved, we responded with lightning speed to provide medical guidance for pilots and air traffic controllers so they could continue to perform their very important safety missions. We also worked with air carriers to ensure the safe transport of dry ice, which is necessary, as we all know, for the transport of some vaccines. And air traffic control on both sides of the Atlantic coordinated to prioritize flights, carrying vaccines and medical personnel who were critical to our response and recovery. At the FAA, we worked tirelessly to keep the air traffic control system operating safely and efficiently while putting protocols in place to protect our workforce. All of these efforts allowed vaccines to get into arms more quickly, slowing the spread of the virus. Now, the FAA has taken countless other steps against the pandemic, and we're willing to share our experiences and our approach with our international counterparts. So we have done so uh, throughout, and we will continue to do so. Of course, COVID-19, as we all know, is not the only major disruptor in the aviation industry. We're seeing rapid uh, technological advances with drones, rockets, and other new vehicles. The pace and breadth of these advances is only accelerating. The FAA issued two major rules on drones earlier this year, operations over people and remote identification. And we've stayed in close contact with our EU colleagues on drone regulatory developments. The US and Europe must continue to work together to promote global integration 
of these new technologies while ensuring that all safety, security, and environmental needs are met. At the FAA, safety will always be the prevailing principle and purpose that guides everything we do. We're also concerned about the potential safety risks of climate change and extreme shifts in weather that could affect aircraft performance. And we recognize the need for aviation to be environmentally sustainable, as Henrik pointed out very forcefully. Now, under President Biden's leadership, the United States has made tackling the climate crisis a major priority. And as you know, we re-entered the Paris Agreement. The president announced a 2030 target to reduce our domestic greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52 percent compared to 2005 levels. And the administration's American Jobs Plan makes key investments in our nation's sustainability efforts. And of course, aviation is a key front in this battle. And the FAA, uh, as our European colleagues are, is pursuing a number of efforts to make flying greener. For example, we continue to research technology improvements to improve fuel efficiency. This is through our CLEAN program. Uh, we continue to research feedstocks and processes that can be used to develop sustainable aviation fuels. And we continue to reduce aircraft fuel burn through the operationalizing of next-gen uh, technology programs and other ways to achieve more efficient air traffic procedures. But these efforts take time. And we need to do more to, do, to reduce emissions in the near term. So the United States continues to support the uh, Corsia uh, program, the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation. We believe Corsia is a practical market-based way to address CO2 emissions. But the U.S. can't do this alone. We want to broaden global support for Corsia and ensure continued global implementation by all ICAO member states. To do this, we've got to continue to work together in multilateral forums such as ICAO and through direct bilateral outreach to enable a sustainable global aviation recovery. Now, climate change is the world's greatest environmental threat. We are eager to expand our research collaboration with our European colleagues to address this significant challenge. The Sustainable Aviation Panel discussion today can be a jump start uh, to these efforts. T now, today's event is a chance to shine a spotlight on the safety and sustainability challenges that affect aviation today. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue and progress in the months ahead. Now, before closing, uh, as others have done, I wanna thank my colleague uh, and teammate, Ali Barami. After three decades with the FAA and four years as head of the Aviation Safety Organization, Ali recently announced his retirement. Now in our system, we don't use the term director general, but in this capacity, uh, Ali has acted as the US director general for civil aviation safety. Ali, you've made a substantial and positive difference during your career. I wanna thank you for your service and for your steadfast commitment to aviation safety. Now, until I, Ali's successor is named, Chris Rushlow will act as Associate Administrator of Aviation Safety. Now, many of you know Chris uh, from his work in our international office or from his time uh, as the FAA's Chief of Staff earlier in his career. We know that he will bring the same energy, focus, and commitment uh, to his aviation safety role as he did to his previous endeavors. Chris and his team are ready to build on the already successful safety partnership with EASA, as well as our other partners around the world. So thanks everyone for your time and attention today and for your active participation. And now I'll turn the uh, program and the podium virtually back over to Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks very much, Steve. Can I just say, I really wish I had that phone, uh, phone ring. That sounds fantastic. Uh, it's my pleasure now to, if Ali is, virtually the Director General for Aviation Safety in the United States. Our next speaker is the Director General for Aviation Safety in Europe. In fact, he is Mr. Patrick Key, the Executive Director for EASA, the European Union's Aviation, European Aviation Safety uh, Agency. And so with that, I'd like very much to introduce Patrick, uh, if you'd be so kind. Thanks very much, Patrick. Take, take Thank you very much, Andrew. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. 
As you can see, I'm broadcasting from Washington, D.C., from AIA offices, and I thank David Silver for hosting me today. It's good to be back in the U.S., and I'm very happy that I could already meet physically with a number of colleagues and friends. We can all say that this COVID pandemic has shown that we are able to continue working remotely and that we can organize our work around webinars and teleconferences and things like this. But believe me, and I have had the evidence of that, nothing truly replaces face-to-face -face discussions. This seems to be highlighted by the current aviation situation in the US, where it seems that domestic traffic is close to reaching its 2019 levels. This, in my view, shows how important flying is for the society and for the economy. I hope that very soon we will be able to fly internationally again. In Europe, traffic is also improving, in particular in the context of the summer season, which traditionally sees massive flows of traffic taking people back and forth from holiday destinations. As mentioned by Henrik, the EU is implementing a EU digital COVID certificate which will be a great help for movements of citizens within Europe. And at our modest level, we published in June together with the ECDC, a new health safety protocol, which hopefully will ease passenger processes with airport and airline operators. Let's just hope that our sector will continue to recover and reach soon the levels meeting expectations and needs of our societies. There are a number of challenges that our sector faces and on top of the recovery. And I would just I highlight three of them. The first one, and that's one of the themes of today's webinar is sustainability. This has always been high on our agenda, but I believe that the COVID crisis has further deepened the need and resolve of citizens to have greener transport. In the short term, as mentioned by, by Henrik and, and Steve, we can expect to see increased demand for sustainable aviation fuel with the infrastructure and supply challenges that it brings. In the longer term, hydrogen and power to liquids offer a promising perspective and we need to continue our work on those new sources of energy. The second challenge is new technologies. And I completely subscribe to what Steve mentioned earlier. Artificial intelligence, electric vehicle, drones, urban air mobility, unmanned traffic management or use space. All these concepts are becoming reality. Just to give you a very simple example, the target start of commercial operations for urban air mobility or UAM is 2024, which in our framework is really tomorrow. The third challenge is, of course, safety because all those things will not happen if not only it is safe, but even safer than what we have today. We've just finished a study on citizens' expectations towards UAM, urban air mobility, which gathered the views of a representative sample of European citizens across Europe. This study showed, and that's very good news, a real appetite of citizens for UAM with more than 80% of the sample being positive or very positive about urban air mobility. But the persons interviewed also ranked safety, security, and environment as their major areas of concerns and therefore expectations. In order to deal with all these challenges, international cooperation is key because, and we see it now more than ever, aviation is international by nature and there are no local solutions to all these challenges. My meetings so far in the US, but also, of course, the permanent contacts we have maintained with US colleagues, also with other international colleagues, have shown that there is a clear alignment of views and perspectives on all these topics. Our relationship with the FAA is a strong and robust one, which was formalized, it was mentioned before, by a BASA, which entered into force 10 years ago in 2011. In the last 10 years, we have been working together with the FAA on strengthening our cooperation to the benefit of industry on both sides of the Atlantic, but also to the benefit of safety. We have defined and implemented processes which allow for formalized communication and cooperative working arrangements on certificate certification projects in particular. 
we have also reinforced our partnership on regulatory and operational topics. We are now in the version 6.2 of the TIP technical implementation procedures. We recently signed, it was mentioned by, by Ali and Philip, the TIP L and TIP S on licensing and simulator. And we are continuing to work in order to make our collaboration more effective, more efficient, reducing duplication, but allowing where needed increased vigilance on safety risks. Of course, this cooperation can always be further improved and the MAC situation has put our relationship under some pressure. But ladies and gentlemen, as you know, aviation safety has always improved as a consequence of crisis because we safety specialists are pragmatic, data-driven and technically oriented. Lessons learned from the MAX were discussed, agreed, and are being implemented by the FAA, EASA, and international partners, both within our organizations, but also in our bilateral or multilateral relationship. For example, the FAA is leading work on the new change product rules together with an international working group. And we have started to work with the FAA, but also with Transport Canada and ANAC on 1309 and human factors assessments. I am convinced that our relationship with the FAA will grow stronger, deeper, and concentrated on increasing the overall safety of aviation products, diminishing red tape and duplication. I must say that even under pressure, our teams were able to work very well together. This does not mean that they were agreeing on everything, but I think that's the way it should be on safety, not to agree on everything. But the teams worked well together because our co cooperation was and is based on principles of technical competence, open communication, and respect. Those are the foundational elements of the robust partnership between EASA and VFA. I would like now, and this will be my concluding words, to pay tribute to Ali Barami, for whom this is the last day in the FAA. Ali and I discussed several times about this, but the four years of his tenure in the FAA have certainly seen a fair deal of challenges. I have to say that throughout those years, it's been a pleasure and an honor to work with such a strong, competent and professional partner. I wish Ali all the best for this new phase in his career, and I'm certain and I hope that our paths will cross again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention, and I wish us all a very fruitful and interesting webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick, and uh, very helpful words, I thought, and thank you very much for dialing in from DC. What a, what a change, what a delight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, also dialing in from DC is uh, Ms. Annie Pestonk, who is the US Department of Transport's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Aviation. And Annie, if I could ask you to add your remarks, I'd be very grateful. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for the opportunity and the invitation to participate in this important meeting. I would like to thank my friends and colleagues in the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration and my friends and colleagues across the Atlantic for organizing this meeting and for working together. I'm so honored to be joining the effort in a new capacity and those of you with whom I've had the pleasure of working with in the past know my commitment to our shared goals and values. For those I'm just starting to work with, you have my commitment to give our joint efforts every bit of my all. I look forward to working with you at what Administrator Dixon has rightly characterized as an absolutely critical time for aviation. President Biden, when he took office, laid out five priorities, COVID recovery, economic recovery, equity, climate change, and restoring America's standing in the world. The Department of Transportation's efforts are focused on those priorities, and the priorities are at the core of our work together to bring international aviation out of the pandemic. And in doing so, as our Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg says, safety is our North Star. 
Our partnership with Europe is absolutely critical. The challenges ahead absolutely demand that we stand shoulder to shoulder to confront them. That's what we're doing in our response to the pandemic. Working with our counterpart agencies across the federal family and in coordination with industry and with partners in other countries, particularly Europe, including many of you here today, we are working 24 seven on the recovery of domestic and international air connectivity, which is so important for our economy overall and for the global economy. And in doing so, we are integrating the president's priorities. Throughout the pandemic, you, our partners in government and in industry on both sides of the Atlantic have helped provide that critical connectivity, enabling movement of urgently needed personal protective equipment, vaccines, medical supplies, and people. To support our shared mission and keep global supply chains moving, we and our partners in FAA have spent many hours undertaking diplomatic engagement and bilateral and multilateral consultations with you, our European partners, and with other nations. And we're grateful to our European colleagues for our commitment and effort. In that regard, I want to address briefly our concerns for the safety and well being of our air crews. As you know, some countries have established requirements for foreign air crews that create significant burdens for US airlines and their employees. At the onset of the pandemic, we worked with our European partners in ICAO to establish international guidance that recommends alleviating burdens on air crews, including testing, quarantine requirements, travel to and from their worksite, and immigration restrictions that apply to other travelers. We view it as imperative that countries ensure that crews are treated consistently with the guidance developed at ICAO, which is so essential to maintain safety, connectivity, and distribution of critical supplies, including vaccines. And we know that you share these concerns, for they are core to the sustainability of the recovery of international aviation. We must work together to ensure that the ICAO guidance is observed. Now let me turn to the priority President Biden places on climate action. At the start of his administration, the president brought America back into the Paris Agreement. He did so uh, with immediately after the inauguration, one week later, issuing an executive order, Executive Order 14008, establishing a whole of government approach to tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. This executive order includes the Department of Transportation in the National Climate Task Force, as well as in the Interagency Working Group. And the president issued another executive order on May 20th on climate-related financial risk, which is an important context for our joint work on tackling the climate challenge. We in the department have responded quickly and strongly to the president's executive orders. Four weeks into the new administration on February 25th, the Department of Transportation and Transport Canada issued a joint statement on the nexus between transportation and climate change. In April, President Biden convened the landmark climate summit that laid the foundation for addressing greenhouse gas emissions across the US economy. It also provides important backdrop for negotiations leading not only up to the 26th Conference of the Parties to the Framework Convention on Climate Change, but also for the lead up to the ICAO assembly in 2022. Following the summit as part of the department's responsibilities under the executive order, the department reestablished the climate change center in the department. And my office, the Office of Aviation and International Affairs is working closely with the department's climate change center as we develop further actions to implement the vision put forward at the summit. Also on April 22nd, the Department of Transportation and the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management of the Netherlands issued a joint statement on transportation and climate change. These statements cement our shared view of the need for climate action and underscore the importance of CORSIA, the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme, as a vital instrument for long-term aviation goals. 
Our goal is to put the United States on track to net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. Our nationally determined contribution aims to reduce emissions by 50 to 52% by 2030 compared to 2005 levels. And here, the United States and Europe have an important role and responsibility in ensuring that our transatlantic partnership continues to lead global efforts to reduce aviation emissions. Two weeks ago at the US-EU Transatlantic Summit, statement signed there recognized climate change, environmental degradation, and the loss of biodiversity as mutually reinforcing extraordinary threats to humanity. We look forward to working with you in the US-EU High-Level Climate Action Group to achieve our shared 2050 goals. I want to mention ICAO in this context. We believe that the 2022 assembly is a critical opportunity to advance key environmental priorities. And we look forward to working with you, our European colleagues, to seize this opportunity. This includes discussion of the long-term goal, Corsia, and other topics. And we, will, we know that this assembly will be critical for not only our shared relationship, but for all of the ICAO member states to show that they are serious about addressing the climate crisis. Corsia is a monumental undertaking by all ICAO member states to track international aviation emissions and hold growth in net emissions to an agreed baseline. We continue to support Corsia and we're encouraged by the broad participation, including the efforts to implement the Monitoring, Reporting, and Verification Elements, or MRV, by nearly all ICAO member states. Corsia, however, is just one of the mechanisms that will help us reach our 2050 goals. Previously, other speakers have mentioned the importance of sustainable aviation fuels. Like Europe, we are giving a high priority to the development and deployment of sustainable aviation fuels focusing on fuels that on a life cycle basis reduce emissions in comparison to conventional jet fuel by significant amounts. We regard SAF as the most promising short to medium term opportunity to reduce aviation's net CO2 emissions. And it will also be crucial for the long-term success of our efforts on climate change. That's why we're working with partners in government, across the federal agencies, in the Congress, and with industry to help boost the supply, bring down cost, and incentivize the production and use of safe and effective SAFs. Tax credits are one important means of incentivizing the delivery of those SAFs, and there is pending legislation now that would provide such tax credits. We are coordinating with partners across the government to provide technical support for this legislation. We're also encouraging greater research and development of diverse feedstocks for SAFs. And we're encouraged by the work at ICAO to incorporate SAF into Corsia. I want to call your attention to last week's introduction by Senators Brown, Warnock, Cantwell, and Murray of the Sustainable Skies Act, which includes incentives to boost the use of sustainable aviation fuels. I also want to mention new technologies, which will be crucial for the sustainable future of aviation. We applaud Europe's exploration of breakthrough technologies that could accelerate the path to decarbonization and seeking alternatives to fossil fuels. New direct air capture plants are being built and some of them will run on renewable energy, which is so important. We're seeing exciting developments in the area of electrification of aircraft, particularly for short hop flights. And we're looking forward to partnering with industry to support the sustainability efforts. We applaud our airlines for investing in new, more efficient aircraft and for replacing older, inefficient aircraft. We note that airlines have taken ambitious climate goals and they've begun offsetting their emissions to, in part to fulfill those goals. They're investing in sustainable aviation fuels, and we look forward to working with them and with you to advance these shared goals. As I mentioned at the outset, the US and Europe will be most effective when we stand shoulder to shoulder. That is why yesterday, the Department of Transportation issued an order 
proposing to prohibit the sale of passenger air transportation, including interline to Belarus. Our order is premised on the Department of State's determination that in light of the diversion of Ryanair Flight 4978, it is in the foreign policy interests of the United States to limit transportation between the United States and Belarus. This is just one of a suite of actions the government is taking to stand shoulder to shoulder with you on the response to the diversion of Ryanair Flight 4978. Let me conclude by saying there has never been a more important time to act and lead the world to address the twin crises of COVID and climate change. We plan to lead with you, our European friends, by fully implementing and standing behind Corsia and by continuing important work to support new technologies, sustainable fuels, and policies to reduce emissions. We stand with you in working together at the ICAO Assembly in 2022 and in our discussions today and in the intervening months. I want to thank Administrator Dixon, General Ho Director General Hololai, Director General Key, and of course, I want to thank Ali Barami for his years of service and dedication and all best wishes to you, Ali. Thank you very much. And I'll now turn the program back over to Andrew. Thanks very much, Annie. Thank you very, uh, I thought really interesting the way you, you took the conversation forward in terms of how we address some of those emission issues and is it SAFs, is it technology and all those other things. That's a debate that we're going to have in about 45, 50 minutes or so, which I'm very much looking forward to. But prior to that, Ladies and gentlemen, we are now changing gears. We are moving from set piece presentations to what I hope is a quite interactive conversation. These are going to be two panels of 40 minutes each, grosso modo, uh, where we will discuss two issues. Obviously, the first is safety, and the second, then, as I just said, is sustainability. Uh, our first panel, which is about safety, uh, is to come. We'll have a break and then we'll do the second panel. The first panel includes, as its speakers, and uh, you can't ask for better speakers than this on the matter of transatlantic cooperation, transatlantic safety, and analysis of the BASA and so forth. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Earl Lawrence, who is the Executive Director for Aircraft Certification at the FAA. In effect, Earl's equivalent, which is Ms. Rochelle Deschler, the Certification Director at EASA, and then three industry speakers who I think bring a really important part of the conversation into this debate. One is Mr. Nicholas Chabert, who is the Senior Vice President of Daher and, of course, the CEO of Kodiak Aircraft. There's a joke there about bears, but I won't use it. Mr. Phil Straub, who's the Executive Vice President of Garmin, and Mr. Jan P, who is the Secretary, Direct uh, Secretary General, I beg your pardon, of uh, Aerospace and Defence Industries, the European uh, a OEM uh, organisation. Gentlemen and ladies, welcome to you all. A pleasure that you can be here and thanks very much for your time. I can't not start the conversation, though I don't think, Earl, Rochelle, by because it's not me that's mentioning the 7.3 Max for the first time. There's been several references to it, of course, already. And, I, and, and obviously it's been the flashpoint, is that the right word? It's been the pressure point for the last year or so of cooperation between the United States and Europe. So I've got two questions, one perhaps for you, Rachelle, and then to you, Earl. Um, what did we learn from the recertification process? And to what extent do you think the fact that we have a, a bilateral air safety agreement was helpful to that? Perhaps, Rachelle, you first, and then Earl. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um... I think uh, all the, the time period that we dedicated to investigate uh, the return service uh, uh, with the FAA, with our uh, other bilateral colleagues and, and, and Boeing was a period actually a very uh, intense uh, cooperation. Uh, and uh, as, as Patrick said, we may not have uh, agreed all the time on everything, but uh, in the end, um, uh, the simple fact that we were able to uh, conclude positively on the return to service at, at the same time is, uh, is a sign uh, that um, uh, we kept working together very closely and, and we managed to reach the same technical conclusion together. And uh, under uh, uh, DFA lead and, and coordination, we were a, a group of several authorities working together really uh, as jointly as possible 
to look into uh, as much detail as possible in uh, in the Boeing uh, case. And uh, I think the fact that we had a bilateral in place and most importantly, uh, very well established relationships uh, at all levels between uh, FAA and IASA, from the top management down to the working level, Uh, and across all panels uh, of expertise has tremendously facilitated the, the technical dialogue. And it lasted uh, over quite a long period of time. Well, it did, didn't it? How long, how long was it start to finish? Uh, I think something like one year and a half, approximately. The longest, uh, eight, the longest almost, 18 months of your yeah. life, I suspect. I said the longest 18 months of your life, I suspect. Yes, you can, you can say it like that, yeah. <laughs> Earl, what's, what are your thoughts? Do you agree with Rachel? Um, it, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I agree. I really like the way you phrase the question because um, the responding to the max incidences, um, tragic as they may, really did bring us together. Um, but it also did take the air out of all of our other bilateral actions, right? Um, it, it really made us focus on dealing with that one issue, um, but it brought us closer together. Um, we were typically meeting, you know, at, at our level, maybe once a year, um, formally in formal meetings, maybe twice a year. Um, and it really changed to the fact that we started meeting every week <clears throat> and, and, you know, and we still, and we've continued those meetings and we've continued to work closely together. Um, and, and I think having the bilateral was critical, as Rochelle was saying, because it had the structure we needed to build those relationships. It had the contacts. Um, folks knew who to respond, to, as Rochelle was saying, from at, at the very basic technical level, whether it be software, whether it, it's structures, whatever we were looking at, we had counterparts that known each other for years, that have worked together for many years. And um, it, it, it just, it, it was just a great opportunity to really just build on that relationship, but it has also been a sea change and, uh, you know, going into the end of the future and, and how we're going to be addressing all the various uh, trade issues and validation issues that we have going forward is going to be different. Um, and, you know, I think uh, uh, Rochelle and I look forward to building upon um, the relationships we built throughout this episode and improving things going forward. Gosh, there's an interesting philosophical debate there, isn't there, about how we can use safety to drive trade discussions. But rather than go down that road, as tempting as it is to do so, perhaps I could turn to our industry colleagues. Nicola, perhaps first to you. Do you think there's been, have you seen a change as a result of the sort of enhanced cooperation? Well, Andrew, uh, thank you for pointing that. I think uh, as an industry, we, we got first nervous about what was going to happen with the 737s. And uh, uh, the way uh, the strong relationship between uh, FAA and EASA has been uh, driven by very talented people, we are we, we sure, and we were, had actually um, a very example of that collaboration with uh, uh, Garmin. We, uh, Uh, have a certification and dual certification of uh, all land. And that was not a given. That was something that had to, uh, to push a little bit the industry and the regulators uh, to the edge. So um, this collaboration between EASA and FA has really taken place you know, with that example. So we are very much you know, uh, happy to hear those good uh, words you know, uh, from the beginning of the webinar that is uh, very promising for the future. Oh, thank you. Well, that's reassuring. Jan, perhaps if I can turn to you before I get back to Philippe and Garmin more particularly, have you found there is a more cooperative arrangement or relationship now as a result of all of this? Well, I think that um, what Rachel has said about uh, from the top management all the way to the working level is starting to take effect. Nothing is perfect and there is a lot to be done, but I, I, I truly think that uh, this is an area where there is a lot that was learned and that is taking a place as we speak. We all knew that uh, the upper level was on the corporation and totally convinced that that needed to happen. Not saying, you know, as uh, uh, Patrick, he said, you know, that you have to agree on everything. But, you know, uh, friends is sometimes uh, the one that has to have, you know, those discussions. And uh, I'm glad, you know, as the industry and especially in GA where 
we're here really to support all of the efforts of our regulators because we are at the edge front of the technology. Uh, we're glad to see. Well, indeed. Um, Patrick, Jan, P, if I could turn to you. Patrick said, as uh, Nicola mentioned, you know, we it's probably perhaps good that we don't always agree. Have you found developments as a result of all of this enhanced cooperation? Thanks, uh, Andrew, for, for putting forward that question. I think, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to state that the industry is extremely supportive of the long-standing cooperation between the US and the EU that goes even far beyond the starting of the BASA that was mentioned already by Ali Barami at the starting of, of this seminar, webinar. Um, and so only to say that for, for many, many reasons, which I'll be happy to explore a little bit further on, uh, industry really needs a global uh, system for global certification dealing with safety issues as it is a global uh, ecosystem that we operate. And from that perspective, the two leaders, if I may say so, in terms of certification agencies, EASA and FAA, needs to be the one taking up the global leadership of how to achieve a global system for certification. Uh, and in that aspect, I think that the cooperation has been excellent so far, even before the grounding of the 737 MAX. I'm quite sure that the uh, grounding in itself has increased and intensified the cooperation and found out weak spots, uh, bottlenecks, et cetera, and that this has been dealt with in an excellent way. So I'm hoping that there is a, a lessons learned from that. And the industry uh, is indeed very supportive of every time that there would be an incident or a, a risk or a threat that there is a unison action from all players in the certification community to uh, collaborate and, and to do so uh, openly, transparently, efficiently. I think this is for in the best interest for all the aviation ecosystem. It's certainly, well, I assume that it's absolutely in the best interest of your members, isn't it? If there's a uniform, uh, unanimous sort of process, is that the view of your members, do you think? Well, I think we've come a very long way. I mean, as said, uh, this is a global uh, ecosystem. Uh, we need to think about it uh, from the perspective that when you put an aircraft uh, to service, it may operate in maybe 190 plus countries over the globe uh, over a long period of time. Uh, and you have several different layers uh, in when you speak about certification. Yes, you don't only have the product uh, certification, you have operators, you have certified personnel, you have flight crews. Uh, you have a number of MROs to do service and maintenance and repair uh, on these uh, products. And if you look at it, I mean, even if the, we've come a long way today, this is not yet a complete system. There are serious gaps. And to point mm -hmm. out one of them, just to exemplify, if you are an MRO operator, you might need something like 60, 70, or mm -hmm. even we know of examples where you need uh, up to 80 different certificates to deal with the same spare part for the same kind of aircraft simply based on who is the owner of the aircraft. So obviously oh, yeah. this is uh, something that creates a uh, loss in terms of uh, efficiency, it creates uh, administrative burdens, cost, uh, uh, raising costs, etc. cetera. Uh, but furthermore, what I'd like to stress is that I see a risk as well that if, I mean, we really need to bring the system closer to bridging these gaps than allowing them to, to, uh, to grow. And when you have a pace of development of technology and innovation that is going faster and faster as now, obviously there could be a risk that this creates an appetite to take a local approach on a certification issue by some authorities somewhere on the globe. Golly. If that would happen, that would be a quicker deployment in the local area, but it would be counterproductive for the effectiveness of the whole ecosystem. My God. This is the point where I think the, the FAA and the ASA needs to have the leader uh, in, in the global I, 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 I would love to throw to you, Earl, and you, Rachel, but before I do that, that's really frightening what you've just said, Jan. Phil, do you agree with that? And, and how, do we, how do we go forward? How do we make the cooperation even stronger to overcome the sort of problems that Jan's talking about? Well, yeah, first of all, I completely agree that the stage in which these aircraft operate is a global one. So when you think about our role as a supplier, Garmin, we have to design equipment that goes on Nicholas's airplanes and others that can operate on that global stage. So that notion of international global harmonization is so important. And when you think about each of the respective organizations, they have their components that focus on policy and innovation. How do we deal with new technology? And then we deal with parts of the organization that find compliance with applicants such as uh, Nicholas and others. And so it's so important that we establish that cooperation uh, interagency that way 
both on the compliance side, but also paving the way for new technologies. Uh, Nicholas mentioned the Autoland system. When you think about that, that spans across the air traffic management system, uh, in addition to just the safety technologies that go on the vehicle. Now fast forward and think about unmanned air mobility, advanced air mobility, whatever term we put on that, there's so many opportunities, I think, to, to collaborate there, bring our best expertise from both sides of the Atlantic together and create a harmonized approach to how we go about certifying these, both from the vehicle safety standpoint, but also the interoperability with the air traffic management system. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last one I'd hand back to you, you know, with the adversity we've had over the past couple of years, I think my experience is adversity can build strength. It can deepen relationships. And I think with the leadership we have in both the ASA and the FAA, I'm confident that that strength and relationship will come out of this and create more opportunities for us to collaborate and work together on that global stage. Thanks very much. I, I'm, yeah. So maybe turning to you, Earl, I was a little bit cynical about safety driving trade, but having spoken to or having listened to what uh, the industry is saying, I can start to see that. Um, the system we have driven through ICAO, and many folk have already mentioned ICAO, is, is actually one of national, uh, national dominance. Each country is responsible for its own things. So clearly states have to find a way to be cooperative. Do you see, I mean, you, you were the person that said we can use safety to drive trade. Do, do you agree with what, what industry is saying? And how do we do that? How do we drive it even closer, even closer cooperation? Um, yeah, I, I, I do. It, it's, and I think you ask a good question of how do we drive it closer? And I, I think what this agreement in between e, the uh, EU and, and the US um, has been critical in building that relationship and bringing us closer together and creates a great framework. I think what we're all struggling with is there's many new authorities other than the, you know, than, than the EU and the US out there. Um, and, and they're all growing and getting more involved as well as air traffic it gets distributed throughout the world as we see it growing in, in, you know, in Asia and Africa and, you know, it, it, they're, they're building their own infrastructures, which creates a new challenge for us. How do we work as a team with all those other authorities and how do we provide um, that, that leadership? And, um, you know, we have a structure for that, too. We, we work very closely with our, um, what we call this, the, the CMT. Um, so there's, uh, uh, that includes Brazil and, and Canada, as along with well, the two of us. So um, what does CMT stand for? Sorry. Uh, cer certification Management Team. Nothing oh, sure. fancy. Sure. <laughs> um, but, but again, the growing those type of cooperative uh, frameworks um, and, 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 you know, across the world, I, say, I think is going to be our next biggest challenge. And, and, and how, do we, how do we show that leadership as states of design um, to bring the rest of the authorities along with us? Because they, they want to know more. Their political leadership wants to understand what are the decisions we're making and why are we making them and, and how do we share that? with everyone else to show that that um, it, it is a system and that we need to maintain the system and, and we can't, it, 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 it's not up to individual pieces, but it's up to all of us to work together. Rachel, do you, do you, Rachel, do you agree with that? Is it all about working together and therefore showing best practice? Is that what it is? Um, I think I think probably we, we should make a distinction between those countries or regions which have a strong, what we call state of design responsibility. So which have a, a strong or developing um, uh, um, aircraft manufacturers, manufacturing industry, uh, and, and uh, uh, those regions which are mainly uh, um, overseeing uh, their airlines and, and our operations and the type of, of cooperation we, we have to set up is, is, is different for, for both groups. With the um, big state of design authorities, I, need, I think we need to um, uh, develop the, really the technical cooperation and, and, and work uh, multilaterally on uh, 
uh, evolution of technical requirements, validation, certification projects, etc. And for countries which are mainly acting as states of, of registry and, and uh, state of operators, uh, we need to be uh, open, sharing information and supporting them in, in discharging their responsibilities. So who does that? Where, where does the leadership come for that to happen? Is it, is it from Patrick? Is it from Henrik? Uh, what level do we start to drive, or indeed from, you know, Ali and, 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 and Steve or whatever, to what, how do we make that happen? How do we go forward? Well, at European level, we have a, a framework of, of multilateral relationships, which is uh, diverse. And um, for certification, for example, uh, we have um, bilateral agreements, uh, formal safety agreements, not only with the US, but with a number of other countries. And when such agreements are in place, it gives a very uh, solid uh, legal framework for uh, a, a beginning of mutual recognition, mutual acceptance, recognition of some of the work done by the author other authority, etc. Uh, yes, yeah, so that, that, that would be a, a key starting point, the, the presence or not of, of a bilateral agreement. So if I can, thank you, thank you, Rachel. If I can turn back perhaps to you, Jan, does that, that strikes me as quite a laborious process. I, I don't doubt for a moment it's legally very solid and all those things. Does industry want that sort of stuff to accelerate? Absolutely. Um, I think I can't underline uh, enough how important these BASAs are and that, that we would reach out and create more BASAs and more uh, include more things in the BASAs uh, that are being, uh, being agreed upon as well. I think we need to, to reflect upon this from two different perspectives, if I may. And one perspective would be, uh, which we already touched upon, that would be the, the increasing speed uh, for technology development, for, for innovations, etc., that would bring new products to the market. And that could uh, initially be an appetizer for regional certification development, which would again then be counterproductive. But that's one perspective. I think another perspective that we haven't touched upon yet in this uh, panel, but that we sh really should consider for the future, is if you look retrospectively uh, on the history, I mean, Europe and US were the ones pioneering aviation. So we brought aviation to the market. We made it happen. We made it fly with the products and with the certification systems. However, when we look into the future, uh, our order books are not full from uh, European or, or US airlines anymore. I mean, the major uh, production now would go towards Asia. So there are, and they were not in this game before, but they will be coming into these games. And, and, and uh, definitely they will go for both being stronger on producing their own uh, equipment, their own products. And this we see certainly in China will be a global player, this we know, but they will also have a bigger appetite on the certification system. So in a way uh, it was natural for Europe and US to have the leadership in the future, I think this is a, a, a let's say, a, a shift of power or a shift of balance that we would have to think about how to deal with that. I have no doubts that uh, Europe and US today has the leading competencies, has everything it needs to be the leader for today. But I think today we need to start to think about how do we ma maintain the control of this global system for the future? Mm. And that's a more strategic, uh, let's say, I wouldn't say long-term issue. I'd say it's uh, maybe it's uh, two decades or something like that. Already in 2040, 2050, this will be a totally different picture. And that is not too long if you think about the lifespan of an aircraft. Oh, no. It, it, 22 decades is, is, a, is really quite fast. Yeah. Nicola, do you, do you agree with Jan? Is, are you finding your emphasis shifting eastwards? Uh, well, in, in our GA market, you know, for, for our company, not really, but uh, globally, yeah, uh, there is certainly some truth. I think it's very true for the commercial operations. Uh, but I, I, I like to, uh, to, get deeper, uh, to go a little bit deeper in the uh, corporation. I think that we, we talk about the field implementation and the working level. I think that's where we have to play uh, our part. The industry is the one who has a lot of uh, technology for uh, proposal and is uh, on the at front of uh, uh, putting forward to the authorities uh, new ideas. And we need to be a, a party to, uh, in, in, in fact, to be a little bit more involved party to, to the, the new path that we have available today. 
The cooperation is there. We talk about BASA. Uh, we have the CS and Part 23 rewrite that is already in place. We, we have to use this vehicle. And the way to do that is to use the technical standards that we have that go beyond uh, what is just a certification path because safety is not limited to certification. Safety today is, in fact, you know, a bulk of operations. So we have to go to air traffic management. We have to go to, uh, we have to, go to maintenance. We have to continue with the licensing as was, was discussed. So it's in fact, you no, know, we touch it to the entire aviation system. And this is probably through the dialogue that we are talking about through a lot of corporations with a, a lot of, uh, 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 I'd say, uh, uh, co cooperation at the at the very ground level on very practical subjects where we can win, um, uh, in fact, the way to lead the rest of the world because we have that part already ahead of every everybody, including Asia, uh, from what I understand. And just taking a very recent example, I had a, one of my colleagues. You know, I went to uh, to Boeing at the uh, uh, safety standard, so he is uh, is in charge of uh, making sure that. Uh, it's safe, and he said, you know, it was surprising to him that there is no differences between a, a small aircraft and a big aircraft. At the end, you know, you are aiming to the same uh, objectives, and uh, there is a lot that we can learn from the small aircraft to, to help the, uh, the global aviation system to progress in so, into of safety. Mm, well, that's really interesting. What about you, Phil? Have you got similar views? Or, well, first, is your business shifting east, eastwards, and then, secondly, do you agree that it's it's actually in the detail that the devil resides? Well, yeah, <clears throat> our business is definitely a global one, and I'd probably take the angle on this a little bit about how the the Part Twenty Three transformation in the U.S. Uh, has really gone from a less prescriptive type method of saying, for example, if I give an example. It was based upon a system with technical standard orders. You know, you have an altimeter, well, it should do this type of thing. Or you have a VHF communications transceiver. You can uh, confine it and say, these are the performance specs. But everything's becoming so much more integrated. When you think about with the aircraft itself, uh, that standard by itself is getting strained to some degree. And then when you think about maybe interoperability, take a communications transceiver. As we transition to Link 2000, Datacom, that type of digital communications, it's now a full system type communications network with air traffic control. Now think about as we evolve into Asia and other parts of the world, the interoperability, the standards, those type of things that we need. So in one way, prescriptivity is very important to maintain, but in another way, we need to allow a breathing room to say, these are the safety objectives, especially as you think about maybe advanced air mobility, what are the safety objectives and can we allow creativity in trying to achieve those? Now think about it from uh, the civil aviation authority about how they find compliance. You need people that are trained to analyze those safety technologies and, and determine whether they really are finding compliance. I just think it creates a whole new realm as you think about how we move forward over the next decade, two decades and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole issue of, you know, prescriptive versus performance-based and what have you is a massive discussion, of course, and one I'm, I'm glad that other people have to have, not me, to be frank. A number of issues, I think, have come out of this for Rochelle and for Earl. One, of course, is as the world moves eastwards, et cetera, what is the role of ICAO going forward in all of this, or, or how do we work within the ICAO framework? And then secondly, I guess, do you think that move from proscriptive, as Phil described, to, to more um, performance-based is the right way forward? And, and how do we do it? Maybe start with you, Earl, and then Rachel. Okay, so um, I, I think the move to Asia is, is, is very true. I mean, uh, everybody listening here knows that. I mean, that's very evident. Um, what we've had to do with it, do to deal with that is what has changed. Um, I would say the amount of resources that I spend with um, Asian authorities has increased exponentially um, just to educate and provide information. And you're asking, how can ICAO fit into that? Well, you know, I, I think for Rochelle and I, a, and particularly, we are now getting requests to do dual certification on, on new innovative projects with, uh, with the two of us 
and an Asian partner all at the same time. Okay. And so I think that is one thing that is really changing and 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 how we uh, I'm looking more and more of, of when we do a certification project, how do we work with the company to present that, um, what they did, how they did it, the story, not just a certificate at the end, but the background and the information, how do we present to that to a multiple of authorities, 80, for, you know, we were mentioning how many, you know, how do you present that to 80 authorities at a time? And is there an opportunity for EASA and FAA to present that directly? And, you know, I, I can think of an urban air mobility project that's going on and, and, and we're doing it trilaterally and um, with, a, with an Asian country. And, and I think that's a good example of how we can continue to build and that will be the transition of our relationship. We can transition how um, EASA and, and the FAA work closer together on these projects. And, and our teams are getting more integrated. Um, I think that's another way to approach that. And I don't know how ICAO can address that, but you know, I think one of the things we're looking at is training and education of our engineers um, so that they're pretty much interchangeable. Um, and you, you, you had, there's something on your mind. You got a question. No, no, no. What, I mean, my question wasn't how do we involve ICAO. My question was what is the role of ICAO? And I suspect you've answered it, which is, you know, sort of overall umpire, if you like. But, but actually the work's got to be done down there at the, at the national and regional level through uh, the FAA, through EASA, through these other countries. Obviously, the other thing on my mind is I'd dearly love you to spill the beans as to which country, which third country you're working with on the uh, on the UAM <laughs> thing. But, but I, I suspect you're much too polite to do that. Rachel, do you agree with that? I mean, do you see that the, that the future is going to be these sort of not only bilateral, but trilateral, multilateral sort of arrangements? Yes, I, I think already today and, and in the future more, uh, the work will be much more multilateral than, than it used to be. Uh, to come back to, to the question about ICAO, I think traditionally ICAO has always played the role of uh, setting the, the big picture and, and the framework for um, certification requirements for airworthiness in general uh, and, and, and not going too much in the detail. But each time there was a major step change to make in, in what we asked for, uh, we, we needed ICAO to, to standardize that. So ICAO has, has a key role to play. I'm thinking, for example, about uh, when we started to introduce uh, design security requirements uh, in, in aircraft, uh, we really needed uh, ICAO to, uh, to set the international frame on that. And now uh, what we have in front of us with new technologies is, is not only uh, new technologies, it's also new types of operations. Uh, it's not only about bringing new technology in, in conventional aircraft and, and for conventional use, it's really new, uh, um, uh, new types of operations, drone operations, air taxi vehicles, uh, which require to rethink uh, the certification, but also all the operational rules. And, and, uh, and also there, uh, I think we, we will need ICAO. Thinking also, for example, about increased uh, automation or uh, uh, certain moves towards uh, um, reduced crew, flight crew operations. For sure, when we enter this area, we will also need a strong uh, engagement of, of ICAO. Finally, on the prescriptive versus performance-based requirements, I think yeah, in, in some cases, it may be very meaningful to, to move from prescriptive to performance-based. And we have achieved to do this in a very harmonized way between the US and ourselves for uh, small airplanes, for Part 23 airplanes. This has been a, really a big uh, uh, cooperation success leading to a harmonized uh, new set of rules. Uh, uh, the key question, I think, for new products is, is more about, uh, as mentioned by Phil, uh, safety objectives. Uh, what should be the safety objectives we put on this or this type of new product or new type of operation? And here we need to find ways uh, to, to coordinate and, and harmonize our answers also. Hmm, that's really interesting. It also, I think, leads to a really interesting final question because, unfortunately, 
we only had 40 minutes and we we're about to run out of them. But I'd like to ask everybody one at a time in one minute only, uh, and I can be very rude if you go long, in one minute only, what is the next most important thing? Or sorry, let me say that again. What is the next really important thing that that the BASA, uh, EASA and, and the FAA need to cons consider together? Jan, what, what, what's your thinking on that? What, what do we need to focus on next? Um, well, I think I think the green transition, which you will debate in the next panel, is an extremely important one. And here, I think this, if there's one key message from my side uh, that that I'd like to, for you to take with you to that panel is that there is no way that there will be an aircraft developed uh, for for the future uh, regulatory frameworks that would only function for one region in the world. So we need global alignment. Otherwise, a technology won't, I mean, certain parts of technology can definitely be there anyway, but the big platforms, the, the big uh, uh, frontier changes in technology, technology shifts, these won't happen unless you can deploy them on the global market. And for that reason, EASA, FAA needs really to be in the forefront of pushing also what the work of, of EKO towards a, a harmonization of this green transition. Yeah, and they, just the the and they will have uh, full support of industry in that role. Uh, that, thank you. I think that's really fascinating. Phil, you're next. What, what do you think? You've already mentioned UAM and, and other yeah. things and IA. What, what do you think is the next big thing? Well, it's hard for me to say just one. There's two things. I'll mention the one that I haven't yet. And I think that's aircraft security. Um, you know, security is at a, in terms of uh, cybersecurity it's an evolving landscape very quickly. And I think generally we have industry and harmonization, we're working towards those objectives, but think how fast technology evolves. Think about our big data world, think about aircraft connectivity that's only increasing both offloading data, but also putting data on the aircraft. So I think it's imperative that we stay at the forefront of aircraft safety that way. And then, like I said, I couldn't pick between the two. So back to advanced air mobility, I think that's a rapidly evolving landscape that we have to just stay on top of. Wow. I mean, at one level, aircraft security, of course, is an IA point, isn't it, as well? It's that whole, it all sort of runs together. Nicola, what, what, what do you think? Well, I just need to add, you know, to what was already listed. Uh, I think that uh, far and foremost, the cooperation, and it's, it's something that is precious. And we can't uh, undermine what, what can be at stake. You know, the cooperation has to be uh, put first so that the safety objectives that we were talking about are going to be done. But the other thing that I'll say to, uh, to take away, our gamma members are also uh, asking for predictability. We need to have, uh, in fact, you know, a process that is going to be efficient and we discussed that we have a framework, but we also need to know uh, when is it going to be completed. We are going to have those new technologies that are going to come into market and this is just the beginning. It's going to go faster. We have already expanded you know, with territories uh, around the world, but we definitely need to have a framework that is going to be also in a defined time. Wow. Predictability. That would, I hadn't expected that. Uh, so in, in a minute, Rachel, what do you, what's your response to all of that? Mm, I think I will cheat and give two responses. I think we need to work on the max uh, lessons learned implementation on the safety side and on the coordination of our responses to the innovation challenges. Okay, that was very well done. You, you managed to cheat and come in well under time. Earl. All right. Um, I was th thinking where Rochelle was heading to and in tactical, but I stepped back from this conversation and said, and, and it actually it's built on something that Rochelle just said, how do we work to achieve a safety goal as opposed to a specific technical goal? And, and in that framework, to do so, we need to work collaboratively and seamlessly between operations, the pilots, the mechanics, the designers, air traffic. Um, I think the example that, that, that Nicholas put out at the beginning, the Autoland system is a good one where you know, we need everybody to work. And then once you field it, we, we have to have everybody work seamlessly. So the relationship, um, for Rochelle and I is, is just including more and more of maintenance and operations. It's not just about the, the, the set design when the TC is issued, but how is this whole, how, how, how is what we're developing going to work in the system um, throughout the world? Thank you. And thank you very much, Rochelle and gentlemen. I, I 
absolutely fascinating conversation as far as I was concerned. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen listening, uh, that you agree with that. I, I think one of the most important takeaways from all of that is, of course, that that there's there's plenty of life in the bus yet and in fact we must work harder uh, and use it to facilitate what we've got to do because as Nicola said things are speeding up and predictability is going to become increasingly important uh, i'd like you to join with me in thanking rachel earl uh, Nicola, Phil and Jan for what I thought was a really fascinating 45 minutes. It could have been one hour 45 and I think we still wouldn't have run out of topics to talk about. Uh, so join me in thanking them again if you would and then let me note that we are going to take a 10 minute break now, just a 10 minute break. So please reconvene at one of either of 10.45 if you're in the United, on the east coast of the United States or 16.45 if you're in Central Europe and I look forward to seeing you then and thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope you had a good break or at least a convenient break or a convenient stop, if nothing else. Uh, I don't know about you, but I do. I didn't make that up. I genuinely think that that was a really fascinating conversation. And as I say, that interface and that interplay between safety and trade deals became evident to me in a way it hadn't ever in the past. But we move from safety, our overarching and always first priority now, to a conversation about the environment more generally and sustainability. Uh, I don't know anyone who's living at the moment in either northwestern uh, North America or in where it's about 50 degrees at the moment, that's 50 in real money, uh, or, or if you're living in Brussels where it's about two degrees and it has biblical rain going on, then perhaps we need to think about climate change more so than ever before. Maybe, maybe it's wrong, but I don't know. I'd like to have that conversation in any event. We can't not have the conversation, as Philip Cornelius already mentioned in his opening remarks. So it's absolutely appropriate that we uh, invite Philip back up to talk about these matters. We're also, Philip is joined by Mr. Lawrence Wildgoose, who's the Ass Assistant Administrator for Policy, International Affairs and the Environment at the FAA. And thank you very much, Lawrence, for making your time available. Mr. Axel Krein, the Executive Director of the Clean Sky Joint Undertaking here in Europe. The Clean Sky Joint Undertaking is a, a government or a European Union and industry joint cooperation adventure to try to find cleaner skies, better, more efficient aircraft and so forth. And Miss Nancy Young, who is the Vice President for Environmental Affairs at the Airlines for America, a, a trade, a, the Aviation Trade Association for Airlines in the United States. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and welcome. Maybe I start with you, Philippe. No one, I think no one questions the need for action, do they? Does anyone now doubt that we need to do something? The question is, what are we doing about it? Yes, um, and um, thank you for that question, um, Andrew. It's clear indeed nobody questions the need for action. Um, and I would say um, not only at the political level, but also in the industry, and I'm sure Nancy will speak to that later on, I think we've seen a really strong shift in, in perception and attitudes in, in the past few years uh, and a realization that uh, there is a need to uh, move within the sector on decarbonization and we can no longer uh, just have the aviation sector contribute to the decarbonization of other sectors as has been the case in Europe through the uh, emission trading system so far. We do need to see um, carbon reductions in sector uh, um, Philippe, you seem to have cut out, so maybe we'll come back to Philippe in a moment. If we can, Lawrence, are you still with us? Very good. Um, what's your view on all of this? What, what are we going to do about it? Yes. Uh, hi, Andrew, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, sustainable aviation is definitely an important issue, and I'm I'm thrilled to be here to have this opportunity to talk about what the FA has been doing to help mitigate the effect of climate. I'll tell you that we have truly been keeping ourselves busy. Uh, the FAA is funding uh, development of new technologies, supporting the development of sustainable aviation fuels. SAF is, is a big issue. It's been mentioned by a number of our colleagues on the line. And then integrating more efficient air traffic operations into to the NAS. Uh, you're probably aware that the FAA has a long-standing history of making strategic investments, allowing aviation to become more sustainable. For example, for more than a decade, um, we have taken a collaborative approach to invest in research and development to determine ways to decarbonize the aviation sector. I'll give you two quick examples. One, the Continuous Lower Energy and Emissions and Noise Program, better known as CLEAN. Another example is our R&D efforts, primarily through a sense which stands for the Aviation Sustainability Center, uh, which is co-led by Washington, Washington State University, as well as, um, as MIT. So what does all this mumbo jumbo mean? It, it means that making aviation more sustainable is an important issue, not just for the FAA, but across the government and industry. So we're taking steps to strategically leverage our R&D dollars to help solve this issue. So 
Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear from, from my colleagues today and look forward to your discussion. Well, thanks very much. I mean, you beat me to it. What does all that mumbo jumbo mean? It was going to be my question. Um, Philippe, coming back to you now, you started to talk when when we lost you about the need increasingly for in-sector improvements and in-sector changes. What did you mean by that? Well, in the past, uh, definitely in Europe, we had aviation contributing to the uh, reduction uh, in other sectors through the emission trading system. Um, but clearly, we see that the, um, for the future, if we want to reach that uh, net zero uh, for the whole economy uh, by, by the middle of the century, we also need in-sector reductions in aviation. Um, and, and we see the industry is, is, is very much convinced of that uh, and also sees that uh, in order to keep the public trust, um, there needs to be that decarbonization of flying itself. Um, to be able to, to safeguard the long-term future of the, of the sector and, and people's ability to travel for hopefully many, many years and decades to come. So um, that's, that's, that's really our, our collective task. And, and luckily, there are means uh, to do that. And I'm sure we'll, we'll go a bit further into those means and ways in, in our discussion. Indeed. Um, have you, the European Union, put any sort of specific mandates or guidelines or anything out there yet? Everyone talks about it. Are we actually making yeah. legislative moves? Uh, we are going to make a, a proposal in uh, two weeks' time, if all goes well, uh, that will go to the European Parliament and the member states in the Council um, to uh, put a, a blending mandate in place for uh, sustainable uh, aviation fuels. So a blending mandate, sorry, just to be clear, that means a percentage of SAFs that goes into otherwise ordinary fuel. Is that right? Exactly. That would be and, ramped up gradually over time. And, and but we're talking, and I'm, I don't know what your proposal is, but say 1% now to 5% in two years and 10% thereafter or something. Yes, those are not the percentages, but... Good, uh, nice are they try. not? I was nice hoping try. I might trick you into it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. So what about you, Lawrence, in the US? Have you got specific goals and legislative targets like that? Sure. So like Philip, don't want to tip my hat. But what I can tell you is that currently the US is developing an aviation climate action plan, which will ideally lay out specifics uh, across a variety of measures to reduce the uh, impact of, on climate. I think everyone here can attest that aviation has no silver bullet to uh, reduce its emissions. So when we formulate how we um, think about our plan, we try to think holistically through what's been mentioned um, here about ICAO, but also through a basket of measures, right? So that means making reductions in, in a number of ways to enhancing technology, um, the use of sustainable aviation fuels and getting that industry um, up and then market-based measures. Um, so. Market-based measures, that's technical talk for tax, isn't it? <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it's tapping into the innovation acro across the industry, uh, working, with, and working with our partners to, to, to help, it, help us achieve our climate goals. Uh, yes, is the answer to my question then, I think. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Axel, perhaps if I can turn to you, clearly there are two or three axes we're going to have to walk down. One is the technology and the technological advances. The second is SAFs. But at the Clean Sky Initiative, you work more on the technology side, don't you? How's the work going for you? Yeah, actually, uh, thanks, Andrew. Actually, we are working on the technology side and we have been making analysis in terms of uh, it, our target being 90 to 100% CO2 reduction. So what, where, where can the CO2 reduction come from? Uh, and we have analyzed the situation and we are convinced that about 40 to 50% of that reduction can come from aircraft-based technologies. Really, uh, half of the reductions are from just changing the engine and the airframe. Is, is yeah, it's 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 not the just. I would I would take the just out, uh, but it's about uh, obviously changing uh, the uh, the uh, airframe, uh, meaning improved aerodynamics, improved structures, improved propulsion uh, systems, uh, use of hydrogen. Uh, uh, all of those elements are contributing to it. Uh, about ten percent we perceive uh, can come from improved air traffic management, uh, topic matter 
matter which we definitely need to count on. Um, and then the delta, uh, 40% roughly, we believe, uh, needs to come from sustainable aviation fuel. So it, it's not one silver bullet, as uh, mm. people have said before. It's a combination of all three levers. Uh, but we believe uh, that it is very important to start uh, with the increase of efficiency to upfront uh, make the aircraft and the air traffic management uh, system more efficient in order to reduce the demand for sustainable aviation fuel so that we are not investing in too much into the infrastructure if, if that's not necessary. Mm, obviously, Philippe, you know, I want to ask you about improving European air traffic uh, efficiency in a moment, but where you mentioned hydrogen, Axel, where does hydrogen fit in vis-a-vis -vis SAF? Is, is hydrogen the end, the end goal, do you think? Yes, definitely. I, I believe hydrogen is the, the end goal. Uh, I mean, we won't be uh, able to succeed without improving, as I said, aerodynamic structure, the, the propulsion efficiency. Uh, definitely, this is an element. Uh, but um, the uh, delta to uh, then taking all the emissions out is the, the, the answer to that is, is hydrogen. And, and there, right. there are two ways, basically. Either we can burn hydrogen in a combustion engine, um, which is very good for CO2 reduction which is uh, less good for some other emissions, uh, or we can use fuel cells, uh, which is a bit further out there, um, and use then the electrical energy produced by fuel cells for uh, the propulsive, uh, propulsive energy on board of the aircraft. So but hydrogen is also. physically larger than fuel, isn't it? I mean, it, so we'll need to change the shape of the aeroplanes. Yes, yes, it is uh, three times roughly the volume. Um, so you, you have to find ways and means uh, to get it on board, uh, to install it on board, uh, to allow the uh, fuel transportation on board, uh, but also on, on ground. I mean, you also have to change the infrastructure on ground. Um, all those elements have to take into account, uh, but it's worthwhile going for it because it's, it's from our point of view, the solution in the, in the longer term. Right. Interesting. Nancy, if I could turn to you, perhaps, from um, the industry's perspective, what Axel says at some levels is very encouraging. We can make massive changes. We can move through the SAF phase, if you like, to hydrogen. Basically, what he's just said to me, as far as I can see, is that your members have to completely replace, replace their fleet. Is that how you see it? Well, I mean, if what you're talking about is a time frame through 2050. So I think... Critically, all of the panelists have struck upon the fact that it's an all of the above strategy. So mm -hmm. it is both evolutionary and revolutionary technology. And the revolutionary technology like hydrogen, electric aircraft for larger aircraft, it's going to take some decades. And that's why I think this US-EU research and development commitments working together with industry, they're very, very critical. I also want to note, um, you know, uh, the industry, as noted, is completely committed to decarbonization. We are very focused on it. In fact, Airlines for America has announced a net zero by 2050 goal across our membership and an array of measures to get there, working across the industry and in partnership with government. And all of that is important. Now, you've heard other panelists say decarbonization in aviation is very difficult. That is because we're already driven to be very fuel efficient. And so bringing these additional technologies, the work that we've done, for example, with the Federal Aviation Administration since 2006 in the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, CAFI, which I'm going to just boast here, has literally created the opportunity for SAF around the world. Those types of public-private initiatives are critical, whether it is in continuing with drop-in sustainable aviation fuel, whether it's in electrification, hydrogen, as Axel says, if we're gonna to go to hydrogen, you need the technology, but you need a huge change in infrastructure. And that's decades of work and we're planning on that kind of thing now. Um, but don't we need huge point, changes in infrastructure to get the, the feedstock necessary for the SAFs as well? Well, if you look at the um, really excellent McKenzie study that was cited um, in multiple places, the Air Transport Action Group Waypoint 2050 report, and in fact, the U.S. feedstock assessment, um, there's plenty of feedstock out there. It's a matter, I think, Andrew, as you're getting at, of making sure the supply chain is capable of getting that, whether it's municipal solid waste, whether it's taking uh, waste gases off of um, steel manufacturing, 
whether mm -hmm. it is, you know, waste um, from crops like corn stover that's left over after you, um, you know, after you um, get the, the actual corn out of the field, that kind of thing. It's really building those supply chains. And that's what things like the U.S. Ascent Program has been working on. And, and I would add with that, what's critical about what we're doing here, again, Ascent, the clean program that Lawrence mentioned, CAFI, those are public-private initiatives where we're dollar for dollar participating as industry alongside government to make these changes happen. And the sustained nature of those is very critical. And we're very appreciative that the current administration in the United States is really ramping up the effort on those programs but FAA did a great job of maintaining them over the years, even in less politically supportive circumstances. Oh, very, very politely put. So do you then support what Philippe was talking about in sort of mandating SAF volume so that we can move forward on a sort of progressive basis? If, if that question's coming to me, the answer would be, it is. we're not ready for a mandate in my view. So we have basically, as I said, created the opportunity for sustainable aviation fuel. Um, we, we literally had to create the safety protocols and the environmental protocols. And the US led that process through the ASTM um, process for the safety side that has been adopted. Those protocols have been adopted by the world in various jet fuel specifications. But we're just now ramping up SAF supply. And so from our position at A4A, we really believe that there should be government support to help with the scale up of the industry, the SAF industry, and then move towards mandates if that's necessary. But we really need the kinds of tax incentives and other support that ground-based alternative fuels have had for decades before we go to a mandate. So we, we would have a slight, a slight different view than um, the EU folks are on the mandate question. Philip, you got a comment on that? I mean, obviously, I could spend all day discussing with Nancy the, the very phrase tax support. But anyway, Philip, you got a comment? No, I mean, I think the objective is is one that we share, which is to ramp up uh, the, the the production and the use of SAF in in aviation. Uh, then the question is really, what are the means to do that? I, I I think what we see in the market. Well, first of all, I want to also commend Nancy and and the other U.S. colleagues for. Uh, for basically um, uh, bringing a number of different pathways uh, to the market by, by securing their certification uh, for, for jet use. Uh, and that's uh, really um, showing to us that there is indeed a, a considerable potential in that area. But what we see is, is a market failure that uh, there, is, there is very little production uh, at this point and there is very little demand at this point. And the reason is a very simple one, which is that the price gap between um, fossil kerosene and all those alternative fuels is, is quite important. Um, and so in a, in a highly competitive sector uh, like, uh, like aviation, it's quite difficult to be a first mover. And in a way we all have to move together um, and some form of intervention is needed. And I, I see also in the US, a form of intervention is being uh, considered. Um, our choice will go towards a mandate. Um, because we see that this will create a um, the legal certainty uh, for both sides, the suppliers and, and, and the customers, that everybody will buy the same amount. Um, if you want to buy more, you can, but at least the same amount, and that suppliers can invest in that production capacity. That's going to be a big new sector, by the way, uh, in our countries. It's going to improve our energy uh, independence as well. Um, and that's where the big change will take place in the production uh, of, uh, of those fuels. Um, not so much on the aviation sector, few uh, adaptations are necessary, uh, but it's the production that we need to, we need to kickstart with, uh, with a mandate. But, but is, I mean, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. And, but is it true that there's going to be a massive market for SAFs? I mean, all over Europe, and I, I think I've read this in the United States as well, there, there are moves to mandate and for, you know force the speed of the uplifting of electric vehicles, electric motor cars. So if only aviation is going to be using the SAFs, aren't we back at the place where in the scheme of things, we're quite a small market? Well, compared to the road sector, yes, aviation is actually rather small, mm. um, uh, but uh, we still have no production. Uh, 
Uh, well, well, indeed, it's simply, but... it's simply much. Uh, it's easier to produce for the road sector for the moment, mm. uh, and so that's why uh, we 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 are convinced uh, that, and we're going to publish an impact assessment study also in in a couple of weeks that shows that there is a lot of feedstock available, um, at least for the for the coming decades from bio sources and from the next decade on more and more also from uh, from green hydrogen to produce uh, electrofuels. So the 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 supply um, physically. Uh, is existent, but it needs to be tapped and harvested. Wow! So, Lawrence, when you took uh, Lawrence, when you took the job um, over at the FAA, did you think that most of the time you'd spend at the FAA would be discussing feedstock? <laughs> um, well, I came in with an open mind, realizing that uh, you know climate was a big uh, priority for this administration. So, uh, we would be discussing a number of things, whether it's uh, feedstocks, cover crops. Um, different ways to make air traffic more efficient. Uh, I I came in with an open mind and and I'm really grateful. The FA has a tremendous staff, as Nancy mentioned, who has been working hard day in and day out for years, quite frankly. We talk about the clean initiative, which has been around since 2010. We talk about Ascent, which has been around since 2013, or even CAFE, which has been around since 2006. And all of these programs are public private partnerships, working with industry, working with researchers, uh, to help us solve this issue when it comes to mitigating the impact of climate on the aviation sector. So, but in the meantime, we've got the European side of this market mandating, presumably mandating, uh, SAF percentages. What and and yet Nancy's telling us quite rightly, I'm sure that that it's too early for that on the US side. What do we do when there is a disagreement between the two sides of the Atlantic? So I think really there are two kinds of differences, right? Differences that are complementary or differences that are divergent. For example, mm-hmm. if we choose to focus in our research funds in different areas, maybe across uh, different energy sources or uh, technologies or even operations, that's not necessarily a problem. I think if we're smart about how we share our information and research and push um, the sector forward, we can be much more effective because we're choosing to contribute in different but complementary pieces of the pie. Now, if we have differences that are truly divergent, uh, if we get you know, too wrapped up around the axle uh, on multilateral policy choices, then I think we need to kind of take a step back uh, and remind ourselves that we all have the same objective. Uh, you no, know, we all agree that we want to help mitigate the impacts of climate on the aviation sector. If we have different views uh, about specific policies and or strategies that could be considered ICAO, ICAO is, is a tremendous forum for us to have these conversations. And I think we really need to increase our dialogue. So we're on the page leading up to the 2022 assembly. Uh, mm-hmm. So we can bring both of our regions together. I think we'll be able to be more effective when we're having that conversation uh, next year. Right. That, well, that's interesting. Axel, perhaps if, thank you very much, Lawrence. If I can turn to you, Axel, Lawrence talked about complementary differences as well as divergent ones. I presume in the improving the technology area, that's that's where we do have complementary differences. To what extent do you, a European organisation, work with your North American colleagues? Actually, we are working with uh, the... Uh, entities in, in Europe, uh, but we are also working with entities being headquartered in the US. Uh, for example, we are working with uh, companies like Honeywell, UTC. Uh, those are also uh, beneficiaries of our program and are working together in the, in the context, uh, mainly with their European uh, entities uh, or subsidiaries, uh, but uh, those entities are connected. And we also have U- US colleagues sometimes of those entities being connected uh, to those, uh, those type of work. So we have more than 1,000 different entities all over Europe, being it industrial entities, SMEs, research organizations, or universities, uh, and um, uh, a few of those are headquartered in the US. So I think that's that's an important element because I strongly believe, uh, and as was said before, uh, it's a global challenge, and we, we can't just concentrate on solving the problem in Europe uh, while the problem in other parts of the world is is tackled in a different way. Uh, Also, in light of the infrastructure, we have been talking about uh, uh, airplanes uh, will need to use infrastructure in Europe as in the US. So there needs to be a consistent move and a complementary move all over the place. 
Right. Um, well, two things. The first thing I think is the elephant in the room that you didn't mention there was, of course, that large well-known airframer whose name starts with B. Um, and whereas I know Airbus is one of your founder members, do you think it's a good thing that there's a bit of competition at that sort of fundamental airframe basis between Airbus and Boeing? Definitely. I, I mean, competition without competition, uh, what will be moving in the world without competition? I think that keeps us all on our toes. Uh, and um, on the other hand, there is there, there are some common elements. And, and also when you speak about Airbus or Boeing, both of those manufacturers will have to put new aircraft into the market demanded uh, by the airlines, uh, beginning of the 30s, uh, mid of the 30s, latest. Um, the uh, 737, uh, the A320 family, those need to be replaced. And I think this is something very important uh, because we believe that this is a window of opportunity for us in terms of developing the technologies uh, between now and end of this decade in order to make sure that those technologies can enter into those products, uh, getting them into the market. And I speak about window of opportunity uh, because we know that uh, that window if once closed, uh, will be closed for 20 years, uh, because then those products uh, will be put into the market, uh, will need to be amortized uh, by the manufacturers and their supply chain, but also by the airlines. And then mm -hmm. the next opportunity will be not uh, 37 or 38, uh, but 2055. So 20 years after 2035 with regard to radically new technologies. So we believe it's now time, and that's why we are speaking now about the concept of skip a generation. Uh, so focusing not just on the incremental tuning here and there, uh, but focusing really on the on the more radical changes and, and uh, maturing and demonstrating those radical uh, technology improvements between now and 27 and 28, so that those can find their ways into that new, these new products, being it on the other side or on the Boeing side, because the people working with us are uh, working with both manufacturers and even the manufacturers in other parts of the world. Well, indeed, thank you for raising the other parts of the world because this is this is healthy competition on, on both sides of the Atlantic. But we were hearing in the last session that much of the market is moving eastwards. We've got thousands and thousands of aircraft flying around the rest of the world. How do we roll out this sort of technology in a way that allows all of the boats to rise with, with the environmentally clean solutions? Let's start with you, Axel, if I may, then Philippe and, and Laurence, perhaps, and then you, Nancy. I mean, that, that is, it is quite natural, whereas the, the supply chain, if you see the tier ones, tier twos, tier threes, uh, they are working for all big manufacturers, uh, for all OEMs. And by th those uh, uh, tier one, two, threes, uh, those technologies get automatically, uh, to a certain extent, slightly in a different way, because it depends also on the OEM uh, architecture and the OEM's concept. But those get into the market more or less automatically uh, into the into the various parts of the of the world, uh, and also airlines. I mean, airlines in uh, uh, let's speak about Singapore or China. Uh, they have a strong interest in getting the best possible products on the market. Uh, there is a business case in there because if you speak about CO2 reduction uh, and by the, before by speaking about uh, fuel burn reduction, uh, that's direct an impact on the on the on the balance sheet uh, and and then on the profit and loss. So, so that's why those products will get into the market uh, if they are uh, powerful and if they are meaningful in terms of in terms of impact. Well, indeed. But Philip, what? If, let's not talk about Singapore and China. Let's talk about Rwanda. Let's talk about Peru. What about those sorts of places? Well, it's clear that um, the aviation sector is is a global one. It's been said many times. Uh, aircraft technologies are are in a global market. Uh, but also, as it happens, climate action is a global uh, action uh, is a global task. Mm. So uh, the two really come together, and and we will have a big job uh, to work with the rest of the world um, uh, to to advance this agenda together. And first occasion will be uh, the next ICAO assembly uh, in 22, when uh, the objective is to agree together a long-term goal uh, for uh, carbon emission reductions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we will be able to work together with, uh, with the US side uh, and many other partners to, um, to, to, to agree there a long-term goal, which by the way, already has been done in the, in the maritime organization. Um, so we always want to be ahead of those. Um, uh, and, and within that general uh, target also to look at all the ways and means that can get us there. 
And we, we will have a multitude of, of, of options to pursue. There's not one exclusive uh, avenue as, as also Lawrence was, was correctly saying. Um, and, and even if we're going to have electric hydrogen aircraft, uh, it's clear that they will uh, only cover a part of the market, important part of the market, but we do see in a, a 2050 horizon still a considerable need for uh, conventional aircraft uh, that will use uh, sustainable fuels. Mm. So going back to your, your question on Rwanda, um, clearly for very long haul, um, we're still going to you know, be using more traditional aircraft, but hopefully with SAF on board uh, around the world and for more regional traffic, uh, hopefully the new, new technologies. Right. Well, I think that makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. Lawrence, you got a comment on that? Yeah. And so I actually take a step back going, going to your question about um, um, competition. I, I think fundamentally competition breeds innovation, right? And, and, all, and we still want to be safe. Safety is our North Star. But in terms of bringing new aircraft on, online, we see great reduction in, in um, so we see great gains in fuel efficiency, aircraft noise, uh, and then of course emissions, right? So, so all of that helps in terms of, of the basket of measures. Now to the question at hand, I think international consensus at ICAO uh, to address the climate change is critical because climate mitigation measures um, are only effective if they are implemented globally. So, as you mentioned, Rwanda, and I think Peru as well. I think there's a lot of variation uh, in terms of how the aviation sector operates from country to country, from region to region, and continent to continent. And there is additionally uh, a lot of variation in terms of sectoral maturity and growth rates. So we really need ICAO to help shape the international standards that can provide a level playing field for everyone while we mitigate uh, emissions. And I think without ICAO, quite frankly, um, we risk a patchwork of local and regional uh, measures that are more complicated and less inclusive. Um, I think the last thing I, I like to say on this particular point is that um, we have put in years and years of effort to achieve the CO2 standard that we have today, as well as Corsia. We put tremendous technical resources to simply propose those standards uh, and we have supported them politically because we did our homework and we knew that their standards uh, had credibility. So we continue to support the maintenance uh, of these standards technically and we're contributing uh, to complementary staff work and the long-term aspirational goal work. Mm, thank you. Uh, Nancy, you and I are both um, experienced enough, that's a polite way of saying old, uh, experienced enough to remember the first time Europe tried to introduce its own ETS scheme internationally. Do you think we've got more chance of getting a, a sort of a standard SAF or a set of, I'm not quite sure what the, word, what the word is here, a set of standard SAF requirements or, or quality controls or whatever? And, and I assume that would help all of your members. Well, first, um, uh, you can see me bouncing on the last one because, you know, aviation has long had a long-term goal. We've had across the entire aviation sector since 2009, a long-term goal of a 50% net reduction in 2050 relative to 2005. And now you've seen so many entities, including Airlines for America, establish a net zero goal. So we are very supportive of the effort in ICAO to establish a long-term goal and um, I, want, I did want to speak to that um, very specifically because I think that that is a, a critical thing. And I think the role that the US and the EU have in that is in working with the other countries, not shoving something down their throat, but working with them to bring them along. And the industry itself is doing that. So when you think about the Air Transport Action Group, we have airlines, airports, air navigation service providers, and OEMs from around the world. So that also addresses your Asia issue, your issue about different countries. We are working together. Now to your question, Andrew, there is a market-based measure that's been agreed and that's the carbon offsetting reduction scheme for international aviation. So your suggestion that MBMs are just taxes, that's not quite right. Corsia is a really good program. I think it's critical that the ICAO states continue to implement that and, and they can augment it over time. One of the best things about that system is it has a three-year review period. So 
we may not end up exactly where we are with Corsia. It is a living agreement. So let's work on those types of things. In terms of SAF, we already have the safety protocols. We have environmental protocols. We got agreement at ICAO on environmental standards for SAF. So what we really need to do now is ramp up the incentives, like through the blenders tax credit that we're supporting in the US that Annie Petsunk mentioned earlier, like through the research and development to get those supply chains more aggressive and the like. And then, you know, to the extent down the line, there could be some kind of overarching policy, like a, a mandate. If there is a sufficient supply, we do not want to create a situation where the airlines have to pay so much money for that fuel that the flying and shipping public is disadvantaged. Philippe, turning then, thank you, thank you, Nancy. Turning to what Nancy's just said, and and she's, I think I'm paraphrasing, of course, but she she supports a uh, a system whereby we give tax incentives to the development of SAF. Isn't the fact that all international aviation fuel is currently tax free something of a tax incentive? Well, <laughs> you, you specialize in surprise controver controversy questions, uh, but I, what I wanted to say is is that. Um, Really, I think it's fine that in different parts of the world, different um, measures are put in place to, to promote uh, SAF. They don't have to be identical. Um, they should preferably not be contradictory, uh, but we can have different ways and means. And, and over time, we will see which ones are, are working best. Uh, I think what is very important now is that we have a, a very much a common objective. Um, and we're all working uh, towards that. Um, uh, with, with the best of, of our abilities. And um, we are very excited. Um, we know that, of course, um, the, the US industry and the FAA and, and, and DOT uh, have been working on these topics for, for many, many years, probably longer than we have, uh, as, as some examples were given by, by Lawrence and, and Nancy, um, and have built up a lot of expertise. And I, we're very excited that today, uh, under the new US administration, we can we can accelerate this and, and really go into the, the next year and mobilize all that work that has been done um, to, um, to really um, set the, the sector on a, on a new path uh, with the support of the sector in a way that we, we didn't have, I think, it, at least not to that extent a few years ago. And, um, and also at ICAO, I think um, the stance of the industry will be critical. Um, and we do hope that will come out uh, all the parts, all the parts of the aviation ecosystem come out with a very strong view going into the assembly, because uh, at the end of the day, it, it's them we're talking about. And I think states will be feel more comfortable uh, to move forward if, if they see that is also the wish of the industry. Hmm. Uh, thank you. I'd, we've only got a few minutes left, unfortunately. Again, we could have spoken for a lot longer, but let, we've, we, twice now I think we've mentioned air traffic control and the inbuilt inefficiencies of those systems. Um, Philip, back to you because you know the European situation is quite different to the American situation. How do we use the arrangement, the agreements and the cooperation between the US and the EU to try to drive some of those efficiencies forward or inefficiencies out of the system? Well, we definitely try to learn from uh, other uh, jurisdictions how, how things are, are working. And we have, since many years, this benchmarking um, system between the, the US um, in ATM and, and Europe. Um, recently, Eurocontrol has done very interesting uh, new calculations on the, the, the potential for uh, emission savings from, uh, from navigation. Uh, and they've come out to something in the order of 10% in, in Europe. Of course, that's, you know, if we would have the perfect flight all the time everywhere, so mm -hmm. we probably won't get that 10%, but we, we really need to harvest uh, at least a, a big part of that 10% with a variety of measures, uh, which are organizational, um, technological. Um, uh, so we're talking about modernizing, digitalizing, and, and putting the incentives in the system. Uh, that all the players, the, the, the pilots and the airlines and the, the, the air traffic controllers and the NSPs themselves, the airports as well, uh, work together to, to, uh, to harvest that potential that is there. And we will be, of course, very, very supportive of that. Um, and, uh, and we believe our, our new uh, legal framework we have proposed for the single sky will, will definitely contribute to, to realizing that. And um, in the US, they have their privilege to have a single organization. 
uh, well, taking care of country. their space. Yes. <laughs> so um, they have a, a bit of a head start. But uh, on on a lot of the technologies, we are uh, we are working together and 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 advancing uh, along the same lines. Lawrence, are you focusing on improving still further the efficiency of the FAA, the ATO part of the FAA? So we are, and you know, I just go back to. Um, the, the phrase I mentioned early in terms of the basket measure. So, so, so we are in, in improving routes um, to, to, to ensure that we can capture fuel efficiency uh, and things of that nature. I would also kind of go back to um, the work that we have been uh, doing with aircraft manufacturers uh, and airlines to, uh, through the CLEAN program. And since 2010, we have uh, the FAA has invested about $225 million, and that's compared to about almost 400 from industry. And during that time, we have uh, contributed to new te technological advances in terms of um, aircraft engine with respect to noise, emissions, um, fans, and, and things of that nature. So uh, modernizing the airspace is an important part of our strategy, and that's something that we've been working on for years but um, also creating the space for staff to, to, to come online uh, at a much higher level is also a part of that strategy, mm -hmm. um, as well as working with industry to help channel that innovation to create safer, cleaner aircraft for today and for the future. Right. Thank you. So, Nancy, I, I realize this, is, this might run out of your area of, com of competence. But a couple of things fascinate me about ATM, particularly in the US-Europe combinate or comparison. One is, of course, in the US, the airlines don't pay directly for the services that they receive. Whereas, of course, when your members fly overseas, in many cases, they do. Uh, and I wonder if you think that's got a difference as to the approach, because we do seem to see something of an, a difference in approach between the airlines of Europe and the airlines of the United States. And then my second question is, why don't the airlines actually complain louder and harder to get the states to improve their ATM? They are the consumers. Why are they all accepting sort of mutual mediocrity instead of asking for competitive advantage? Well, it's interesting that you say that because I think Lawrence would probably disagree. We, we yell loud and clear about our interest in improving the air traffic system here. It's a terrific safe, the safest system in the world in our view. Um, but it can be better. And so that's why part of our green infrastructure push includes uh, focus on more next-gen equipage, improved management of performance-based navigation, uh, more oceanic airspace um, improvements, et cetera. So we are, we are making those pushes very, very loud and clear. Now, our system is run, as you noted, differently. We just pay in a different way. So it's mm. not it's not accurate that we don't pay as aviation for the services. We have, as you know, a number of charges that are applied to airlines and to passengers for using the system. And certainly we have a pretty significant tax system here too. So it is a different approach. Um, and, and you may recall that a couple of years ago, A4A was trying to work on sort of getting to a, 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 a different corporatization of the program but we are very happy that the FAA is focusing on efficiency within it. And we're gonna keep yelling on about it because it's not only a green initiative, it's also you know, enhancing safety, throughput. And as you say, Andrew, it's part of competition. Well, indeed it is, thank you. So we are all but out of time. So Axel, my last question is to you still on ATM. To, we're about to come into the eighth or even the ninth generation of the airframe and the airplane but we're still only now coming through to the third generation of ATM. To what extent could we do the ATM on the aeroplane itself and ask the aircraft to do it, which would then ease the load on the ground and, and so forth? Do you think the future is much more self-separation, much more self-ATM? Uh, Indeed. Uh, I think that's uh, the, the way forward, not to avoid the the ground stations uh, and the problems around the ground stations, uh, but I think the, 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 the advances with regard to technology, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, and, and all the technologies which are related to it, I, I think we have a chance to 
to be uh, self-sustainable on board, uh, which does not replace totally the, the ground management, obviously, but we can be much more autonomous at aircraft level. And I think that's definitely an advancement, which we also foresee in the context of the, of the further aircraft improvements, uh, definitely. Well, thank you very much. And I'm glad you agree with me on that. Ladies and gentlemen, Lauren said it, it's a basket of measures and it runs from technology to SAFs to other incentives to uh, improvements across the board. And uh, another fascinating conversation and another conversation where I think the cooperation across the Atlantic is going to be a really important axis of, of what we do. So with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking uh, Philippe, Nancy, Lawrence and Axel. Um, and and to let you know that we now move back into some closing remarks from both Steve Dixon and Henry Colloway. So they will be uh, almost immediate, but I'd like to thank our panel one more time. And with that, uh, I think, the yes, indeed, I'd like to ask Steve if he'd like to um, be so kind as to give us some closing remarks. I mean, Steve, I think we've learned quite a few interesting things here today, haven't we? Um, including that well done, but keep doing better. Is that a fair summary? Oh, absolutely, Andrew. And, and great job uh, running the program today and, and keeping us on time. Really appreciate uh, you know, your involvement and your uh, well thought out uh, questions and dialogue with the panels. Uh, you know, this, uh, th these discussions were uh, very detailed, very robust, I think very engaging. And, uh, and really, I think, reinforced uh, the importance of collaboration between the U.S. and EU on so many levels uh, and, and the challenges that we face together, uh, but also the tremendous opportunities that are presented uh, to us. So uh, I want to also thank the panelists for joining. Uh, everyone brought a very unique and important perspective to the discussion. Uh, I think on the safety panel, uh, it was clearly demonstrated that the U.S.-EU uh, bilateral safety agreement is at the very heart of what we do. And uh, it is a, uh, a living and breathing agreement that we continue to refine, and that continues to refine and, and make our, our collaboration processes even more effective, as several have said. It lays out the framework for us to work collaboratively on safety issues, and there's ongoing conversation on a multitude of issues at the technical working level. Um, the FAA, the European Commission, uh, you know, DG Move in this case, the FAA's Aviation Safety Line of Business and IASA work with uh, one another and industry, as we have seen, to come to the safest, most efficient processes. Our technical teams communicate regularly on a wide variety of issues. Many exciting new entrants among them, like uh, eVTOL, drones, environmental approvals, uh, to collaborate, share best practices, and harmonize uh, where we can. This way, when we each make policy, it's based on data and well-thought-out decisions. Now, we know that the recovery pace for international travel is still unpredictable. It's, it's probably going to be a little uneven, uh, but we know that people expect and deserve the highest level of safety when they return to the skies, regardless of where in the world they are flying. And that's what we're all about. The citizens of the U.S., the EU, and around the world are expecting us to continue to work collaboratively to build upon current levels of safety. Now, whether it's with traditional aircraft or with emerging vehicles, we've got to work together to certify uh, civil aviation products in the safest and most efficient way possible. Now, you know, on the, on the safety panel in particular, uh, I really was impressed with the emphasis on collaboration and cooperation. It's absolutely critical. You know, our systems and processes are different in certain respects. The administrative rulemaking processes, uh, you know, the governments operate a little bit differently. As we talked about a little bit on the last panel, we have a federal system in the U.S., uh, and the EU is, is organized a bit differently. But leaving that aside, uh, I think that, that we have worked on the, on the technical issues uh, in, in great collaboration and great alignment. Now, as, as some have said, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we always agree, at least initially, on every single point. Um, that's actually a good thing, in my view. Uh, it is, it's happened throughout history. 
Uh, it's happened in my experience, uh, even within a single company, there's always, you know, you can't get 10 pilots to agree on anything. So, uh, so that's actually a good thing because you're able to have these debates, have uh, professional disagreements, but get ultimately get to uh, the best answer uh, through that process. So, you know, that debate and disagreement is actually very healthy. Um, in my view, it's nothing new. And it is something that we will all use uh, to improve. I also liked um, Rochelle and Earl talking about uh, what I have called a holistic approach to safety. You know, when we look at uh, our history, sometimes there is a focus on compliance and on, on technical items maybe that might be in a checklist. And it's important that we take a systems approach. I know that we've worked very hard to do that at the agency and uh, EASA, uh, you know, does that as well. So, you know, that is really important because nothing in aviation is zero risk. We've always got to be looking to, you know, use our data, uh, see where the risk is, be able to see around those corners and figure out uh, what the next set of actions are uh, where we need to uh, maybe add a layer of Swiss cheese or make the holes in the Swiss cheese a little smaller uh, because that's what we're all about. And that, that's a continuing journey that we will always be on. Um, and then finally, I think that uh, it, it was reinforced at many points. And I think, I know Henrik and I are very gratified uh, to hear this, the importance of the bilateral agreement as a foundation, but we're constantly building on it and improving it uh, to, to, uh, to bring us closer together. And that is uh, extremely important. Um, we also talked, of course, today about making aviation greener, which we all want. We've looked at ways to reduce fuel burn and uh, CO2 emissions. We've also looked at the development of sustainable aviation fuels, quite a bit of dialogue about that. Um, and we want to ensure global support for Corsia. Uh, there is no, I think Lawrence said this, you know, there is no silver bullet. Um, we've got to make sure that we are continuing to uh, evaluate the data and continue to make sure that we are tracking uh, around the globe, not just between the U.S. and Europe, but certainly we each have uh, together an important role to play, you know, in this area. The sustainability panel highlighted the importance of having a plan, and the U.S., uh, EU, and industry are looking at a multitude of ways to address aviation's climate impact. To be successful in drastically reducing emissions, we again, we have to work together and work towards globally implementable solutions. Coordinating research projects, connecting researchers, making smart decisions uh, with our respective uh, areas of expertise helps us develop the data and the tools that we need to address uh, the climate crisis. You know, I liked, uh, uh, Nancy's comment on the last panel about, you know, we have a responsibility uh, to work with uh, those and bring along those uh, around the world. And, you know, if you look at something like Corsia, uh, you know, she referred to it as a living agreement. And that's really, you know, we're going to we're going to set a plan out there, but no flight plan. Uh, is, is flown exactly as planned to its destination. You've got weather, uh, you've got maybe things that you have to address on the airplane. You might have to make some deviations to make sure that you get to your desired destination. And I think that's very, uh, very true here as well. We're going to have to stay engaged. Uh, this is a journey and uh, we've got to, to, to put the plan in place and then measure our progress and then make the adjustments uh, as we need to going forward. Um, and, uh, and then and really the FA is eager to help you know, take these next steps. There's a lot of great work that's already been done and we look forward to continuing uh, to contribute in a big way. So as I said at the beginning, uh, it's great to see you Henrik, uh, value our, our collaboration, our friendship, our comradeship. We value our longstanding partnership with the, with the uh, European Commission, uh, DG Move, and EASA. By working together, we will continue to be successful. Uh, thanks again for your partnership and your leadership uh, and your words today. And I know I look forward to continuing and expanding our partnership 
uh, in the months and years ahead and hopefully seeing you uh, in person very soon. Thanks very much, Steve. In my experience, you get 10 pilots. To get that by definition, you'll get 15 views. Um, <laughs> Henrik, if I, if I heard Steve right, what he wants you to do is disagree with him. I think that's what he said. I think disagreement is healthy, um, but we should always try to find a bilateral solution. Last words to you, Henrik, just to, to wrap up, if you'd be so kind. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Well, you talk about uh, trying to agree with 10 pilots, tie with 10 lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> That will be even more challenging, I'm sure. Or 10 but, economists. Uh, oh, well, that's a bit easier, <laughs> I think, uh, being an economist. Um, Steve, thank you for your very kind words and also for your um, leadership and partnership. And um, if I start from, uh, from that way, you in a way ended, I would say that I think that uh, today's event also uh, showed uh, how precious, uh, valuable and important uh, this uh, partnership is. Uh, for us, but uh, I would even dare to say uh, for the rest of the world, because uh, uh, the leadership we have shown over the past decades, and I'm sure I continue to show, is also uh, the um, uh, has improved uh, the global safety record uh, significantly, and uh, we continue to uh, to work having this in mind, also supporting uh, different constituencies and uh, making sure that the aviation uh, safety continues to be uh, the uh, number one uh, priority in, uh, in aviation, and, uh, and rightly so. Uh, I would also say that uh, I think we have been uh, very smart uh, together, and of course our teams, uh, by, by choosing uh, the, the key subjects uh, for, for today's event, uh, which were uh, safety and uh, sustainability. I think those go uh, extremely well uh, together, and uh, and I think we have captured also the uh, uh, the two uh, key elements which are uh, creating a lot of discussion in the in the global aviation fora, and uh, and clearly continues to need to be addressed. Safety always being there in the center of any aviation activity, while of course uh, sustainability needs to get uh, much higher attention, and I think that came out as well very well in uh, in today's uh, discussion. Uh, and third general remark I would like to make also is about the uh, global aspects. Uh, I think this came out in, in both panels. Uh, uh, we need also uh, very often global interoperability. We need global solutions. Uh, we need ICAO also to, uh, uh, to be fully engaged, but we also need ICAO, which is able to deliver. And uh, I think that both uh, uh, the EU member states and US have been doing a lot in order to uh, uh, further improve the working methods and the efficiency of ICAO's work. And there is no doubt that uh, we will also uh, continue to do so in the future, because for us, this multilateral fora has always been there in order to drive a uh, certain level of excellence in the global aviation. And uh, we have been contributing significantly to that uh, over the over the decades over the 75 years of the uh, 77 years of the of the ICAO's existence so um uh, what i what i would like to also uh, point out from the from the panels then i'd say that um uh, uh, very 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 good points and i'd like to uh, express my gratitude uh, towards all the speakers uh, panelists uh, who made themselves available uh, but first and foremost, uh, who uh, contributed uh, so uh, uh, eloquently to, uh, to the discussions and uh, brought the level of the discussion on a, on a very high level. And um, yes, uh, EU and US need to cooperate on certification of new technologies and innovative products. I think this is a very uh, important point, and this also shows the direction where we will be going if we take our BASA as the basis, because uh, uh, BASA is also a living document, and we have been able to add more elements into it. And I think that uh, this is definitely something where uh, we also have many opportunities in the future to, uh, uh, to work together, because uh, the technologies are actually uh, developing fast, uh, and, uh, and there is clearly a need uh, for uh, uh, always being a bit ahead uh, with the certification processes, but that also means uh, good, uh, good cooperation and uh, also exchanging information in a, a very uh, efficient way. Uh, need for, to ensure global interoperability, and, uh, and I think that is uh, very, very essential. Uh, certification work uh, will become also more multilateral. So again, the, uh, the global element uh, with, the, with the ICAO's uh, role. And, and we also, industry also came out very clearly to say that we need uh, global alignment. 
Baza as the basis of our cooperation, but uh, of course uh, not only. And uh, clearly, uh, the need to uh, to continue to deliver in that framework and go beyond uh, is something that we all want to want to achieve. On the environment, I think that was, uh, I mean, first, uh, there was no doubt that uh, all partners being from industry, from the um, regulatory side, aviation needs to reduce the CO2 emissions and uh, EU and US have taken steps at the policy level and continue to make these steps. Uh, and also the industry agrees to ensure a long-term perspective of the sector, which I think is very, very important. Uh, very good discussion on the sustainable aviation fuels. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, what I also said in my introductory remarks, that uh, this is a topic that uh, we should uh, uh, embed in our cooperation and, uh, and definitely work far more closely than we do today was, was very much echoed. And I think that uh, also the fact that uh, we have chosen a little bit of a different path, but that's not the point. The point is that we all want the same aim and, uh, and, and we are there to, uh, to get there. And um, of course, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is very important that uh, we also support all the global measures that uh, drive the sustainability forward, which I think is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is essential because we don't want just the EU and US uh, to, uh, to make these steps. We want the whole global aviation industry, all the regions in the world also to come along and uh, we need to be there to, uh, uh, to support them. And, um, and of course, uh, other potential areas for cooperation, technology development, policy development, uh, and also uh, working with third countries, supporting rollout of new technologies. I think that was also a kind of a recurrent message that, uh, that is very well uh, echoing the, the sentiment that was, that was present uh, uh, today. And uh, also the fact that the policies and measures should be complementary, not contradictory. I think, uh, I think this is, uh, this is uh, also uh, an extremely uh, important uh, comment as such. So uh, all in all, I would, I would like to uh, really uh, thank you, uh, Steve, and your team uh, for, uh, for fantastic partnership and also for making this event uh, possible. Andrew, uh, as always, you have been an uh, impeccable moderator. Very, very happy to, to have you with us uh, today and surely also uh, in the future. And of course, I would like to use the opportunity to thank each and everyone who was attending this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest. I hope that all of you enjoyed also the discussions, uh, uh, presentations and the high level uh, uh, debate that was going on over the last hours. So a big thanks to all of you. Well, thank you very much, Henrik, and thank you for your kind words and yours too, Steve. Thank you, Henrik. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That brings us to the end of today's celebration of the 10, 10th anniversary of the bilateral air safety agreement between uh, the US and the EU. I'm delighted that you could be here. Uh, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. And with that, I'd like to wish you either a very good afternoon or a very good evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>